Okay, let's start. Sure. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this uh, ISA travel course. Um, my name is Wendy Her. I am the president of this uh, uh, Kansas Western Missouri chapter. And uh, I'm also the associate professor in the department of uh, uh, biostatistics and data science of the uh, University of Kansas Medical Center. Uh, we're happy to have her uh, three instructors today to give us a short course about structure regression modeling. And uh, Dr. Uh, Izuru uh, Ratnes Yek. <laughs> 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 Uh, we'll host the, the meeting and then uh, uh, and then I will watch for the questions. Okay, and uh, uh, let's see. We still have one instructor not here. Okay, I will give a brief introduction of the uh, uh, three instructors. Yeah, uh, he's, um, he. I think he just knocked on my door. So he. Oh, he, okay. Is that? Yeah, he's right here. So, <laughs> oh, okay. That's Dr. Great. Be <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm going to join from my office next door, but yeah, his office is right down the hall from me. So, <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Oh, a bit before I uh, introduce our instructors, I, I uh, we have uh, Dr. John Cakley also on the panel list. Uh, he is the communication officer in the ASA national office. That's right. And we also have an important uh, person here, uh, uh, Dinesh. Uh, <laughs> try your last name. Uh, uh, Mudarantha Kim, okay. Uh, he will be providing the technical support for this short course. And uh, thank you very much for working us through and make things, uh, make sure things are uh, uh, um, uh, 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 running smoothly, okay. Uh, so maybe we wait a little bit for a doctor. Uh, Pazinski to join. Yeah, he should. He should it's be okay. talking on yeah. any minute. So. Oh, so uh, you guys have the uh, structure equation modeling book. Has it been published? Yes. Yeah. And I was about to in my intro to the intro <laughs> that uh, the outline for the course I'm about to give. I'm gonna show that and everything and there's a discount code as well so oh cool, cool. for asa <laughs> members yeah <laughs> mm -hmm. so our three instructor they co-authored uh structure equation modeling book just came out mm -hmm. yep, i could even hold it up right here so there we go great great hello there's dr Przinski as well so we're all here now. <laughs> okay, thank you so much for joining. Okay, so um, Dr. Doug Ganzella, so uh, is a tenured associate professor of medicine and population and quantitative health science in the Population Health Research Institute at the Center for Health Care Research and Policy Metro Health at Case Western Reserve University. He uh, he is a biostatistician with specialty in structural equation modeling and the longitudinal data analysis. His research interest lies in the area of mediation analysis, factor analysis, mixture modeling, uh, psychometrics, age period cohort analysis, and their application to both clinical trials and observational studies in health and medicine. Uh, Dr. Adam Pazinski is a tenured associate professor of medicine and sociology in the Center for Healthcare Research and Policy at Metro Health and Case Western Reserve University. Uh, uh, he is also the founding director of the Patient Center 
Media Lab. His doctoral degree is in sociology and his current research interests include novel strategy to eliminate health disparity outcome measurement over the life course and research met methods. His methodological expertise spans in the continuum from focus group and uh, uh, ethnography to psychometrics and the structural equation modeling. Uh, Dr. Adam Cole, uh, yes, thank you, is a clinically and a quantitative trained investigator. He is an, uh, yeah, they are all the co-author of the structural equation modeling uh, for health and medicine. He is a nationally recognized as an expert in pediatric patient reported outcome and measurement. He uses structure equation models, multi-level models, and contemporary test theory, uh, such as uh, item response theory, to advance the methodological science used to measure health and health-related outcome from the family and children's perspective, investigate the corrugate uh, correlate of children and their families' well-being and investigate and eliminate health disparity. Thank you for uh, giving us this opportunity to learn this uh, 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 useful tool. Uh, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, let me share. Oh, it says you, you disabled screen sharing. Yes, I'm not a, I can't screen share right now. I'm gonna have to do it all in sign language, Doug. <laughs> all right. Or by memory, right? <laughs> Can you try now? <laughs> Yeah, I'm able to screen share now, Doug. You should be able to. Okay. There we go. Yep. And let's see if I could. There we go. All right. Um, well, thanks for Wendy for that really nice introduction for all of us. Um, we want to thank the Kansas chapter for inviting us to speak today. So we're very excited about this. Um, we have a bunch of other sponsors we just want to recognize. So Adam Przinsky and I are at, employed by Metro Health Hospital in Cleveland. And Adam Carl is employed by Cincinnati Children's Hospital. There's also the ASA to thank for um, sponsoring this whole series of traveling courses we've been giving. So I showed the copy of the book, but here it is again. And it's also our disclosure that a lot of the material we're speaking about today comes straight from our book. And we report this book royalty agreement with Taylor and Francis. The book was published earlier this year um, and we have a website for it. You could also go on Amazon and and ASA members are entitled to a 30% discount. And I heard recently this discount code may not be exact. So if anyone has trouble with that code, we, we'll figure out what the re exact code is. An outline of the course is first Adam Carl will give an intro to SEM. Then I'm going to talk about the theory of SEM. Then Adam Carl will get into the measurement modeling piece of SEM or the latent variable piece of it and talk about measurement bias as well. That at that point, we'll probably take our 30 minute break and refresh and people could eat lunch as well. And then come back and I'm going to talk about the structural part of structural equation modeling, which is mediation and moderation. Then Adam Przinsky will talk about all the great longitudinal applications of SEM. And then we hope to end with some discussions. 
However, we're, we're very informal here in the sense that throughout our talks, feel free to interrupt and ask questions or just chat questions and we'll get to it throughout the talk as we're going. I also wanna mention there's really two big reasons why we're giving this course. Um, the, the most important reason is we're all just big SEM enthusiasts, the three of us, and getting a chance um, for a half a day to just discuss SEM and talk about it and answer questions about it and hopefully teach about it is just the perfect use of half a day for us. And then of course, the other reason is this book we wrote and we, we wanna really share the material. We're excited about the, everything we came up with that pertains to health and medicine in particular of how to apply SEM. So having said that, I'm gonna turn it over to Adam Carl now for a intro of what SEM is. Thanks, Doug. That was a great introduction there. Um, so I, I want to bring up just one thing before I get rolling. We have tended to have done this in the past as just a big meeting. So oh, there we go. So there, Wendy addressed some of that there. Feel free to type your questions in the, in the Q&A or here in the chat box. We really do encourage you to interact uh, and really love conversation. Uh, so if, if it gets sufficiently complicated, we have no issue with you making it so that others can view and, and just have a conversation with us uh, if that's helpful to them. Uh, so I just wanted to make sure we said that. We really, you know, when Doug said uh, spending a half a day talking about SEM is fun for us, he wasn't kidding. So we, we really encourage interactions uh, and really look forward to hearing about the work that you're doing and how we can help facilitate that um, today or later. All right. Let me share my screen here. I can only see the quest to Q&A. Let me see if I can get the chat or Doug just in, <coughs> Doug or Adam, just interject if uh, stuff comes up in the sure. chat. Yeah, Adam, if, if questions come up, either Adam and I will interject and let you know. Okay, perfect. All right, so in case you've forgotten uh, who I am between the last two introductions, I thought I'd give you one more slide just in case. Uh, this has my email on it in case you want to reach out afterwards. Um, and Doug is really tired of this joke, but all the mistakes and errors are mine, except the really bad ones. Those are all Doug's, especially if they have equations. So they're totally Doug's mistakes. Um, all right, so. You know, usually we all have a little bit of time if we were in person to get to know each other. So I figured I'd throw up a little bit of picture that encapsulates a lot about my family. And that's my daughter and my wife and one of our sheep. We run a small farm sanctuary for abused and neglected farm animals. And that's Vicus. Um, she was, she is still scared of people, but she's finally not scared of us. So uh, she's a sweetie. Um, all right, so my goal <clears throat> right now is really just to provide a, a very high level overview of structural equation modeling, get you oriented in some of the terms. Uh, this is not meant to be an in-depth dive. Feel free to ask questions if you have them, but know that essentially every topic that I briefly raise here, one of the three of us will go into in more detail. So structural equation, equation modeling has its roots in social sciences. I think I meant, I think to me, I, I like to mention that one because it tells you part of where it's coming from, uh, but also because I, to me, a big part of SEM is trying to make sense of the world as we see it, uh, and it's, or at least as our data see it. Um, and it's, it's really flexible in that way. It's not, it's not a trying to force the world into a, the small little multiple regression equation that we have available to us or a simple correlation. I mean, I know there are lots of complicated things, but I think in many of the social sciences in which this has its roots, you know, you're, you're stuck with having variables all over the place and lots of complicated relationships. And SEM is really well suited to that. And I think that's be partly because of its roots. So it's a very general, flexible, multivariate technique that allows one to examine the relationships among variables. Uh, it, that's accurate, but also not super helpful. 
Uh, we, believe it or not, have spent multiple calls and multiple meetings trying to come up with a definition that we thought was sufficiently specific and yet encapsulated all that SEM could do. And we really only kind of came up with <clears throat> a couple of things for these slides. But trying to be a little bit more specific, uh, we use sets of equations to describe the relationships among several variables. So let me just give you some terminology here. Uh, we have in SEM, we like to talk about observed variables. Um, these are the variables that are measured and recorded in the data. These are things like um, cardiovascular events, question responses. In an SEM figure, which I'm gonna put up in a second, these are squares. So this is a big giant SEM figure. Um, uh, anything with a square in this figure represents a value that's actually observable and in your data set. <clears throat> so by observable, uh, I don't mean that it necessarily is, um, you know, you've gone there and done it, but it could be something like someone's self-reported re self uh, response. So we also talk about and really focus a lot in structural equation models on latent variables. These are the unobserved or indirectly observed variables in our model. These include things like social support, self-efficacy in the model we just looked at, or things like depression, it really truly anything that we don't measure directly. Uh, they are the circles in an SEM figure. Uh, they're indirectly uh, measured by observed variables. And these are also called factors, and constructs, and all sorts of words like that. So in this figure, social support, self-efficacy, mental health, and obesity are all latent variables. This goes over better when you're in person, but I, I really like thinking about uh, correlation this way. Uh, I used to think correlation implied causation, then I took a statistics class and now I don't. And then she says, it sounds like the class helped. And he says, well, maybe. Uh, just always find that uh, useful uh, in, in part because uh, we like to talk about causal pathways in SEM. So these are the directional arrows in an SEM figure, but we also allow for correlational pathways. And these are the bi-directional arrows in an SEM figure. And so here we have a directional causal path. This, this figure is hypothesizing that social support causes changes in social support cause changes in mental health. It's worth noting that there are lots of terms that we parameters here that we haven't talked about yet, but we're not saying this model isn't positing that so that changes in social support cause all of the changes in mental health but rather that some change in social support causes a change in mental health. But you also see here that a correlational relationship is hypothesized, that social support and self-efficacy are correlated, but there's no directional causal link between the two. And then there are a couple other words you might hear kicked around today. One is an endogenous variable. This is a dependent variable in at least one equation. It's an outcome variable. So mental health here uh, depends on changes in social support. Notice that it also then goes on to cause other things. So if something can, is an endogenous variable, it means it, it simply means that it is a dependent variable in at least one place. Oops. Whereas an exogenous variable is a variable that is only an independent or predictor variable. It is not caused by another variable. So if we go back to this figure, we can see things like family history, SDS, age, smoking status, these variables up here. All of these are only predictor variables. The arrows are going towards other things and no arrows are going towards them. Then in terms of our building blocks of SEM, most of what you may have heard about if you've read about SEM is are these continuous latent variables. So if we go back here, this model is, is at least as drawn as hypothesizing that social support is a continuous variable. Self-efficacy is a continuous latent variable. Um, this represents <clears throat> the in initial development of structural equation modeling. And one of the reasons it's, it's been so difficult to define structural equation modeling is that there have been some substantial 
growth in the field and is, have wedded what we might call traditional or historic structural equation modeling with things like mixture modeling. So now we can also have categorical latent variables that can also influence other things and all those pieces. Uh, and uh, Adam will talk about those much later today. But you've probably heard about confirmatory factor analysis. Uh, this is a way that we look at the relationships among a set of variables, and we are hypothesizing that there is a latent variable that is causing people's responses to questions or is causing the observed variable. Confirmatory factor analysis is hypothesis driven. Uh, it corresponds to the measurement part of SEM. And to make this a little bit simpler, we have this, pic this figure here. This, we have a measurement model, we have a latent variable causing responses to these. Uh, these, could, these would be items. Uh, I don't have all the parameters in here. I just wanted to show this figure for you. Now, if we take the measurement side and then we think about the path analysis side, uh, which is a form of regression multivariate statistical analysis is used to evaluate the hy hypothesized causal relationships among observed variables. Um, we can take that and, and have the conceptual extension of path analysis, which would look very similar to what we had earlier, except it would only be the observed variable. So path analysis is just focused on the observed variables. But if we put that together with the measurement part and the path, diet, the path analysis part, we link them all together into structural equation model. The measurement model describes how the observed variables measure one or more latent variables. And the structural model describes the relationships among the latent variables, as well as any observed variables uh, in the model potentially. Now in SEM, we tend to focus on the plausibility of the model and we test and evaluate that using the observed data within this framework. And what we focus on is the fit of the model. And by fit, we're talking about the extent to which generally we are able, uh, we have a model implied covariance matrix and we evaluate the extent to which the model implied covariance matrix uh, does a good job of matching the observed covariance matrix. The farther away our model implied covariance matrix is from the observed covariance matrix, the worse we would say the model fits. So again, here's this big thing. We've talked about a whole lot of pieces in here. We would fit this model, which we would do all at once. It's a simultaneous model. And this model has, believe it or not, an implied model covariance matrix. Uh, and we would examine the extent to which that model implied covariance matrix reproduced, did a good job of reproducing the observed covariance matrix. So I know that was a ton of concepts. <laughs> uh, it was really just intended as a very basic introduction to SEM. We haven't mentioned all sorts of things, error terms, uh, just to name one. Uh, uh, really, our goal here was just to introduce these terms, the concepts, the idea that we have causal frameworks within SEM, uh, and that the thing, the pieces that undergird all that. I think before moving on, I want to make one really important point that, is, that people ask about if we fail to mention it is, the reality is a causal framework depends on collecting good data. And so if we have one slice of, of data from one point in time, we can set up our model and specify causal pathways in our model, but our ability to talk about them in a causal sense is pretty shaky uh, because we, don't, we can't show that changes in one thing preceded changes in another. Uh, so if you want to really have a strong causal framework for your structural equation model, you need to have data that will support that causal framework. Uh, you know, you can have, you can specify time running backwards in the model. The equations don't care, but obviously that doesn't make any sense. I want to just give you a, a briefly mention some of the software that we use in M plus or that we use in uh, structural equation modeling. Uh, I'm giggling there because as you'll hear from the three of us, uh, all three of us use M plus. It is far and away the most versatile structural equation modeling software. Uh, it can fit extremely complicated models. You can have continuous and categorical latent variables. You can use multi-level structures. You can have multi-level latent variables. You can incorporate complex survey designs with weights. You can do all of that at once and more stuff. 
Uh, in addition, it has very robust online discussion boards. Um, Mutane, who developed uh, M plus and is really a heavyweight in the structural equation modeling field. E, his wife, and Timor, who are probably the two most senior people at uh, Stat Model. Uh, all together, the three of them, they're very active on those boards. Uh, so you get really good in, input. There's an extensive historical record. It's pretty cheap. Uh, at this point in my career, that feels cheap. I know when I was a graduate student, that would have felt like a massive stretch, uh, but that's not a lot of money. Um, and that's for a license. It's, that's it. Once you buy it, you've got it. That's not a yearly fee. Um, and I also want to mention none of the three of us have any financial relationships to M+. It's just that useful to us. Uh, I also want to mention that there are things that there's Run M Plus and Stata, which is written by my colleague Rich Jones. It's a really fabulous little ADO file that lets you call and run M Plus from within Stata. It brings uh, generally all of the parameters back into the, in, the Stata environment that you can use them as macros. Um, just, it's just really super useful. And M plus is limited in its ability to do things like data management. So it's great to be able to do that all at once. Uh, M plus is also limited in that every time you change something, you have to save it. And it's really easy to accidentally overwrite your work. So one of the reasons I like to run M plus is I can write all of my models out in one long piece of code and run it and always get to the same place. M plus automation is a very similar type of uh, thing written for R uh, and lets you access the things that you have in R, including its uh, ability to, to create figures and things. Uh, but there are other options that are, you know, candidates up there. Levon, Amos, SAS, PropCollis, Catalyst, Stata. Uh, Stata has made some, some growth in the last, it was either the last or the second to last version, uh, OpenMX and Lizeral. But again, none of these can do all the things that Stata can do, or I'm sorry, M plus can do. Uh, it's just, it's just for, if you're going to get involved in doing structural equation modeling, you're gonna wind up using M plus, uh, I think. So uh, I can pause and take a couple of questions. If there's anything really basic that you have or wanna make sure we touch on. If not, Doug will now formally, uh, more formally introduce structural equation modeling. Going once, going twice. All right, Doug is still black on my screen, so I will. Uh, there he is. Doug, your video is off. as is your microphone. There you go. Okay. There we go. So thanks, Adam, for the great intro. Um, now I'm gonna take a deeper dive into the theory of SEM. So all SEM data analysis follows some steps. And we're gonna go over First, if you have a single structural equation model, there's four basic steps to that. Um, one is you need to specify your model. So you need to determine which variables go in your model and the, the direction of the relationships between these variables. So while this is a single step, it's a very complicated step. And we'll get in a little deeper to that shortly. Then you estimate the model. What SEM really emphasizes is this third step about model evaluation. So more so than a lot of traditional statistical methods, we really emphasize looking at model fit. And finally, if assuming your model is a good fit, or even sometimes if it's a poor fit, um, we go on to do hypothesis testing over after that. There's many other uses to SEM. There's more exploratory data analysis. So 
when you think of exploratory factor analysis or latent class analysis, growth mixture modeling, these are more exploratory techniques. There's another type of exploratory data analysis, which is model revision. So you start out with an initial model under a given specification, and then you look to make changes to that model. And that's the purpose of your analysis. And finally, there's a, another use of SEM where you put several models head to head in, uh, and look for what's the best model out of a group of models. So this is more confirmatory analysis. And a typical example of this is you might have a one factor model and two factor or three factor models. And you want to know, given these models, which one's the best of the group? Is my measure unidimensional or is it not? Now, particularly with the type of measures we use in health and medicine, the introductory SEM examples out there from the classic work doesn't fit exactly. So both Adams and I in our work have had to make adaptations to the basic theory of SEM to get it to work for what we do. Um, first is just a real wide variety of messy data sources. So real life clinical trial data, survey data, or electronic health records data, for example, are really messy and complex. So tra translating a conceptual model that you come up with of the ideas of the relationships under study into more formal structural equation model can be very difficult. Output a lot of times in the software you use, if you're using M plus or something else, you get some output and estimates of your parameters and model fit. And it's really difficult sometimes to make a clean interpretation. There's a lot of review and usually with a whole team of researchers before you interpret it a certain way. And there's this real careful consideration of theory, logic, and prior literature. And that's a concept I'll probably repeat throughout. Um, and this is mandatory in really all SEM research as you make these strong causal, causal assumptions and you wanna make strong causal conclusions. So some basic data and modeling issues that are really not talked about in a lot of classic textbook or they're discussed, but really not emphasized as we do is most of our data is not gonna be normally distributed. There's going to be a lot of missing data in the type of databases we come across. And usually there's a lot of potential confounding to think about. We can't do a model and estimate a treatment effect and then interpret it cleanly without thinking about potential confounders. So given that little introduction, I'm talking about SEM and health and medicine and the basic steps to data analysis. Let's dive deeper into each of those concepts. So model specification. As a researcher, you'll have a conceptual model in mind and you have some, a database in mind as well. So you have, you could say, I could use these measures and I'm gonna think about what's the relationships between them. And then model specification, you're translating your conceptual model into a real formal model. Now in something like traditional linear regression, there's a real dependable structure that we don't give much thought to. So we are specifying in that we say, this is our dependent variable on the left-hand side of the equation. And on the right-hand side, I have a whole bunch of covariates I wanna put in. Um, and this is how we specify the model. It's a real dependable structure. In SEM, there's just many possible ways we could do it. Um, variables, could, you, you have multiple dependent variables. It's a multivariate technique. 
So it could get very complex um, and you have to work carefully with a team of researchers most likely and come up with a specification that makes sense for your study. Then once you do that, the idea that Adam Carl showed you path diagrams, it really gives this rich language to, to causal assumptions and to SEMs. It's, you visually depict your conceptual model. What's the relationships under study and how do they look? And finally, within equations, um, we could actually come up with what's the functional form of the model. So the path diagram doesn't make assumptions at all about the nature of your variables or, and then that comes later on when we specify the functional form, we'll make distributional assumptions. And then we have this real working structural equation model that we can analyze. SEMs are tip could be written as a system of regression type equations. And these are referred to as structural equations. There's going to be parameters under your given model specification that summarize the relationships you're after. Um, and one thing is there's this literal matrix notation that's used that could express all SEMs and special cases of it. So let's take a little bit deeper dive into these abstract concepts so you can visualize it now. So here I have a study and I'm looking at the relationships between time since symptom onset, mobility impairment and depression level in multiple sclerosis patients. Under the first specification, I believe that a longer time since symptom onset leads to a higher depression level. Also indirectly, I'm hypothesizing that with increased mobility impairment, that will lead to an increased depression level. So under this specification, depression as an oval is a latent variable. And we have nine items from, for those familiar with the PHQ-9 scale, uh, which is a depression screening score used a lot in clinical practice. We're gonna, un, we're gonna say there's a relationship between a latent variable for depression and these nine items. And then our measures for symptom onset and mobility impairment are observed. So they're within rectangles. Now, as you can see, I have various parameters uh, under this specification. So there's factor loadings, there's measurement error, and Adam Carl will talk a lot deeper into that issue when he discusses measurement modeling. There's also these regression causal path parameters, and there's disturbance terms, which are the error term in the structural model part. So in the, in the causal network relationship between variables part, there's error terms there as well. Now in the second specification, I have the same variables and I have the same indirect effect. So from symptom onset through mobility impairment to depression. However, I'm taking away that one regression path between symptom onset and depression. Now, if you theorize that depression occurs early and throughout the life cycle of an MS patient, this is a totally reasonable specification. The idea that specification one and two could both be completely plausible, and it's up to you and your team of researchers to decide which among the two you want to use for your particular study. And given that you choose one or the other, you'll have a different set of parameters, mainly that gamma one, two parameter is either you're gonna estimate it or you're gonna constrain it to zero. Now, among this, there's also many not so plausible specifications that you could rule out immediately. So the third specification just doesn't make sense conceptually. Um, a higher depression level wouldn't lead to a longer or earlier time since symptom onset. So 
we could rule out many specifications. And then there's a group of plausible ones that we need to look at theory, prior literature, and logic and really choose between them for our particular study. So given the first specification, we could take the parameters and express it in terms of some structural equations. Um, so for the latent variable depression, there's some regression type of equations to relate the nine items of the PHQ-9 to this latent variable given measurement error involved as well. And then there's equations in the structural model part that relate depression, mobility, and symptom onset to each other. And in most computer software programs, this is, a, this is the useful way of writing out SEMs because you'll equation by equation have some way to input this into your software to let it know what specification you're using. There's also this literal matrix approach which sums it all up in terms of three equations. So you have your measurement model piece um, where you're forming your latent variables. You're relating your observed items to latent variables. So there's, for any endogenous variables, which are dependent variables in at least one equation, and then your X variables are always independent variables. In the structural model piece, then you're relating latent variables to each other. So this approach specifies a full structural equation model. And what I mean by that is that every observed variable is an indicator for a latent variable. And then every latent variable is used to be regressed upon each other in the structural part. So given this really broad framework for the literal approach, a lot of the models we actually analyze are special cases of this. And for those interested, I refer you to the classic textbook by Kenneth Bolin, which really is there for all the theoretical underpinnings of SEM. So it really deep dives into all the theory. So some special cases. Um, when we do confirmatory factor analysis, which again, Adam Carl will talk about next, um, this could all be done within one of the equations in the measurement model. There's also a reduced form. Um, as you see, for the structural model, I'm relating the latent variables to each other. So the eta is on both sides of the equation. So we could re doing some linear algebra, we could reformat it. So eta is only on the left-hand side, and then on the right-hand side is all our covariates. There's observed variables in the structural model. So even in my MS depression example I showed, I showed you a structural model which included observed covariates. So it wasn't all latent variables relating to each other. And this is an important special case in health and medicine because I almost never have all latent variables. It's usually one latent variable and then I have these single item observed variables I use in my structural model. So what is the assumption there, if you're doing that, you're saying my observed indicator is per, it accounts for all measurement error. Um, so for example, y equals a dot then. And that's what I'm using in my structural model. Um, and this assumption is very reasonable for many observed indicators we use. So if we use, if we have a measure, for example, of height or something, we're gonna, we're gonna say that we're accounting for all measurement error when we take someone's height. Now, there's a lot of extensions for, the, for these literal equations as well, where we could extend the right-hand side to include additional observed covariates. And this exception, again, Adam Carl will address this, is how you could look at measurement bias, that an observed covariate directly relates 
to the items that underlie a latent variable. There's also a special case I want to go over now and then talk more generally. So can anyone guess the special case um, if we take beta and equal to zero, and then we have X, a group of covariates um, that are observed variables in the structural model. And then our, we have a single dependent variable Y in place of eta. Well, this special case turns out to be multiple linear regression. And the point, the bigger point here is that a lot of the models you use nowadays are all special cases of structural equation models. So whether it's ANOVA, um, logistic regression, linear regression, et cetera, um, survival analysis, you could go on and on. You could take that SEM framework and then it's a special case of that framework. So now if we take specification one, we could look at the mo a modified literal model again, because we have observed covariates in the structural model. And we could express this in terms of some matrices. Here, we're tricking the measurement model a little bit with mobility impairment and saying it's perfectly measuring itself. So I have no measurement error involved in mobility impairment. And then in the structural model, we see we have it, um, the left-hand side are dependent variables. So mobility here plays the role of both a dependent variable in relation to symptom onset and an independent variable in relation to depression. And then on the right-hand side, we also have symptom onset, which is always an independent variable, and we have all our parameters. So given the form of an SEM, now let's talk about the model estimation stage. Now, an important point to note um, is that if for a real introduction to it to some people. They think um, this model is ca capable of look evaluating hypothesized causal relationships and these mysterious latent unknown variables. So there must be something just magical about this process that is beyond statistics. And the neat part about it to me uh, in first learning is that it's really just sound multivariate theory that allows us to estimate these models. So what you're doing at a, at a larger scale is you're either supplying a sample covariance matrix or preferably raw individual level data into your chosen SEM software, such as M+. And then it's going to output your free parameters and give you your model fit. And the aim is we want to most closely reproduce that covariance matrix. So what's first my, a little bit mind-blowing is that a lot of the statistical approaches we're used to really estimate about the mean. But here, we're looking at these complex hypothesized causal relationships with multiple dependent variables. So we have to go outside of that and use the covariance matrix instead. Um, and we could also use estimate means as well, which is something I'll talk about shortly. So given all this, um, th there's always that cynics view regarding what SEM claims to do, which is saying that, well, you're telling me that the covariance matrix then is a sophisticated sufficient statistic for estimating causal relationships. And I don't believe that's true. And the answer to that is there's actually no response I could give statistically that proves that's true. Um, really, you're basing, again, causal assumptions are based on logic, theory, and prior lit literature. And given you could hypothesize that, then this approach um, will allow you to estimate the effects and also discuss the plausibility of those assumptions. So 
an example of how we do this sort of thing all the time is if I were to tell you scientifically that smoking causes lung cancer, that's something that we really accept scientifically. Um, it's not something that we question, well, smoking is associated only with lung cancer, and I can't go further to hypothesize causality. So this is the type of assumption we use all the time and base it on evidence we already have. So the, the basic hypothesis then in SEM is that there's a population covariance matrix, and it's going to be equal to this reproduced covariance matrix in terms of your parameters of interest, this model implied covariance matrix. Um, so what it is, is the, the model implied covariance matrix is then meant to represent your population covariance matrix in terms of the parameters. In practice, we don't often have population covariances. We have sample covariances in, in, within our data that we have. So this is often used in place of the population covariance. And then the, our, our, our aim in model estimation then is we want to choose the parameters which yield the model implied covariance matrix as close as possible to our sample covariance matrix. Um, and as I said earlier, we could also analyze means um, to include intercepts and means. So a real brief example of how this all works is that in this simple linear path model, um, regressing BMI on physical activity here. Um, in this case, I set all my intercepts and means to zero. And we have a sample covariance matrix. Given we only have two observed variables, the covariance matrix is going to be the variance of BMI, the variance of physical activity from our data, and the covariance between the two. And then given our specification and using statistical inference, um, we could come up with what these exact covariances and variance are in terms of the parameters uh, um, I have in the model. Um, and then we want to use an estimation method that gets these two as close to possible. So the basic technique we use um, in the starting point is maximum likelihood. The assumption, of course, because we have multiple dependent variables in SEMs is that multivariate normality holds. Now, under skewness, um, if your distribution is skewed, which is the third moment, um, maximum likelihood actually performs very well in SEM. What sometimes problematic is kurtosis. So this is kurtosis gives you an indication of how many outliers you have in your distribution, which of course, since this is multivariate data, it could become very complex to figure out what's an outlier and what's not an outlier. So if your kurtosis ends up high for variables as well as in your multivariate distribution, this becomes problematic for maximum likelihood. Fortunately, there's a lot of more robust techniques available than that can handle kurtosis as well and correct your standard errors. So really where I start with in analysis, given I have continuous outcomes is robust maximum likelihood, which corrects the standard errors. Um, and this is almost my default estimator rather than just regular maximum likelihood, which we use a lot in traditional modeling. Another alternative, which is robust, is if we use bootstrapping techniques. There's also many modifications of ML if you have missing data in your data set. So uh, uh, one of the defaults too is full information maximum likelihood. So this will allow you to use all observations in your sample um, so you don't have to throw out cases in your data. And it's 
handles data under the assumption of missing at random. Another alternative to that is multiple imputation, which is valid under the same assumptions. And finally, if you have ordered categorical outcome data as opposed to continuous data, there's many techniques available as well. So there's robust weighted least squares. Um, so weighted least squares in itself is robust, but this robust technique then further corrects standard errors as well as model fit measures. Uh, and basically, no matter what kind of data you have, count data, survival data, there's an estimator available to do it within the SEM framework. So I mentioned that estimation based on the covariance and classically, a lot of people will set, would set the means to zero and just estimate the causal task. However, in health and medicine, uh, I believe it's very important to also estimate means. Um, first, a lot of the approaches that we use, um, if we have missing data, we necessitate raw individual level of data as well as sample means to use the FIML approach. There's also all the robust estimators we do use means as well. In some things, like Adam Carl will talk later about multi-group analysis, um, it becomes very important to look at latent means and intercepts for this. In longitudinal data analysis as well, we want some baseline intercept in order to help interpret our model of results. Now there's many alternative estimation approaches. So, for those who are more Bayesian, there's Bayesian SEM approaches. Um, myself and the two atoms were more frequentists, but we're not opposed to using Bayesian approaches when it shows that it's, um, it helps with our analysis. So there are really complex SEM analysis that don't run as expected unless you do use a Bayesian approach. So one example to this, if you want individual level scores on a latent variable and your indicators are categorical, you need a base to use a Bayesian approach to get those um, individual factor scores. And there's many great books on Bayesian SEM and there's a freely available chapter by Kaplan, which gives you a basic introduction for those interested. So given that we talked about model estimation, let's move on to the model fit piece. And again, as I said at the beginning, SEM just really, really emphasizes this model fit piece. So why is that exactly? Well, under a specification, we're using typically using really strong hypothesized causal assumptions, and we're analyzing latent variables. So Given that we have a specification, we want to know something about the plausibility of our assumptions. If our model fits well, it helps us establish internal validity of measurement, and it really helps us establish that our causal assumptions are plausible. So how does model fit work? As an overview, the better the model fits the observed data, the better one reproduces that covariance matrix uh, after plugging in estimates of the unknown parameters. So the closer the model implied covariance matrix is to the sample covariance matrix. Um, typically, we don't look at just one measure to evaluate model fit. There's a whole host of them, and each will have different strengths and limitations. And kind of talk about different aspects of model fit. The basis is chi-square testing. So the, really the chi-square test statistics becomes a basis for many model fit measures. I think I see in the chat some. Yeah, so um, one of the people asked, my understanding is that we need to standardize all variables before fitting SEM. And I wrote back that that is not the case at all. 
Um, yeah, right. Right. Correct. So that's so when Doug is getting at including means and things like that, you know, where we're not, you know, I, I think I have done this before. I have standardized a couple of times. Yeah. Uh, not every variable I have done it. Sometimes I will change the scale of an observed variable if the variance is wildly larger um, on, in this terms of a scale, right? So if I have income. Uh, on a zero to five hundred thousand dollar scale, and then I have a variable, bunch of variables that are on a like say one to ten scale or something. Sometimes the model can have trouble converging because of the huge differences in the size of the the metric of the variance, not so much the proportional part of the variance. Yeah. Um, so you may wind up doing some things like that, but you don't need to standardize at all. So you're still able to get it means. Yeah. For exactly the reasons Doug's talking about. Yep. Yeah, no, it's a great answer. Yeah, to say thank you. That's my my question because I, I didn't have a lot of experience with structural equation modeling, but we recently have a project, and then we actually standardize every variable before fitting it. But I I saw that the n plus, uh, the output have for each variable have an intercept. Is that the mean? Yep. So that's yeah. So basically. The, M plus by default will give you the intercepts. So okay. there's a step further where you could treat your independent variables as having a distribution um, that you have to specify in M plus. So you could get all means and intercepts, you know, for your, and that becomes necessary if you have missing data. You actually have to ask for means on your covariates as well. Um, because then it'll use all cases in the data. Um, so from from what Adam said, so it's uh, important to make sure the scale are similar. No, it doesn't. So we don't do it. But if your scale, sometimes it has trouble converging. I mean, similar to any traditional techniques, if you have one scale where just the variance is way out of line, you know, then you might think about, then I would do it, but I would do it with any statistical technique, you know? Yeah, but, yeah I, I apologize if I gave that impression. I was just mentioning that every once in a while you might run something and you can't think of any earthly reason why it won't converge. And then you'll, and you'll go like, oh yeah, I forgot the income is on some humongously different scale than everything else. That was, yeah. I, I never, the, the only time I think about rescaling stuff and and or something like that, I, I wouldn't standardize. I would rescale it to be clear. Um, and uh, the only time I do that is if I have this the issues like we're talking about. Yeah, okay. and that would be an example of Doug. That would be an example of when the M plus boards are really useful because I think it was yeah. Linda who, <laughs> who connected me to that. But having said that too, there you if you are not interested in means and intercepts, then you can standardize prior and then analyze only the covariances. Um, and, but what M plus and other programs will do, and I'm, I was gonna show this shortly, is they will give you a standardized solution as well. So they'll give you the unstandardized solution and a standardized solution. So you could interpret the answer like nicely in terms of like correlation coefficients. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so I see another question right in line about standardizing the variables for factor analysis. Again, you don't have to. It's it's this it's a, it's a similar answer if you're items are way you know apart from each other and you would do it in any st traditional technique then you should scale that variable but it will do the same thing yeah and factor analysis yeah good answer from adam cross it's just a special case of it so it's everything i just said applies for factor analysis as well um so get back to the chi-square test statistic. Um, it's really the basis for model fit. So you chose your estimator that minimizes your whatever fit function you use. Um, and then you could obtain a minimized fit function from that. So under 
maximum likelihood, for example. And from that, we could derive a chi-square test statistic. There will be an associated degrees of freedom for that. And what the degrees of freedom depends on is the total number of observed variables in the model, which give you an indication of the pieces of information. And pieces of information, it, it, it's the number of means, variances, and covariances among the observed variables. Um, you also have the number of free parameters you're interested in under your given specification. So these two numbers really dictate what your degrees of freedom are for your model. Um, it turns out the chi-square test is not very useful in SEM. It's really sensitive. So if, for example, your database is too small or too large, it will almost automatically reject your hypothesis that your model fits well. So what we're looking for is a non-significant p-value and your p-value is almost always gonna be significant when you use chi-square testing. Um, so this turns out to be not particularly useful. So we typically report it, but no one puts much emphasis into the chi-square test. What turns out to be a lot more useful is the root mean square error of approximation. So what it does is it takes that chi-square test statistic and then it corrects for model complexity as well as sample size. And it gives you an overall fit index, which is a continuous measure. So the lower the RMSEA, the better the fit. And I give you rule of thumb cutoffs for what's considered a good fit. You could also construct confidence intervals around the RMSEA and test an equal fit hypothesis. And it really becomes the basis of does your model fit well? There's a whole host of other indexes and we usually report the group of them and they all work slightly differently. And we're looking to interpret some across all these fit measures, is the model a good fit? Um, so what it is, is these are the ones I typically report myself and which M plus gives you. So CFI and TLI are more incremental fit. So they compare your model of interest to a null model that leaves out the covariance. There's also the standardized root mean square residual, which is another measure of global fit. And collectively, using my rule of thumb guidelines, um, this is what's considered an acceptable or an excellent fit. Um, and sometimes you could end up in between the two, or what's very typical is that one measure will say you don't have an excellent fit, and others will say you do. So it's some way of interpreting the group as a whole. So now to give you a concrete example of SEM analysis, if we take that second specification and we estimate our model using M plus, um, and here there's a database of 3,500 MS patients, I get all these estimates for my parameters. Now in line with Wendy's question here, while we didn't standardize our variables at all, we're reporting standardized estimates. So here, M plus really standardized everything, and I can interpret our coefficients in terms of a correlation coefficient. I use a non-normal estimate. The estimator I use is maximum likelihood with robust standard errors to take into account this data with skewed and kurtosis. There was missing data, so I used the FIML approach and gave it individual level data. And there were also potential confounders. So in the causal path between symptom onset and mobility and between mobility and depression, I also included covariates in the software. What we get here is we estimates. So this 0.15 would say, that a longer time since symptom onset increases the level of mobility impairment and it's a small effect size. 
as we can interpret it in terms of a correlation coefficient. Uh, the relation between mobility and depression is 0.06. So this is a very small effect size. So while it's statistically significant, given the size of our data set, I would say clinically, that's not very significant. We could evaluate the model fit. So this is M plus output here for model fit. And considering the guidelines we talked about, um, given the sample size, as I said, chi-square test is almost always going to be significant, and we don't want to read much into that. Now, looking at our other measure, RMSEA is below that 0.05 threshold for an excellent fit. And the confidence interval is tight around our measure and below that threshold. CFI and TLI are also relatively very high and excellent fits. And so is SRMR is below, well below our threshold as well. So I would say this, we could conclude from this that our model is a relatively excellent fitting model. Now, one thing I commonly use is M plus automation. And Adam Carl briefly mentioned this. Um, it's a package within R designed to run M plus. So you could streamline M plus input and output into R program. And this is really useful in that you get all the benefits of R to, you, to manipulate your data, clean it, um, look at graphical displays. There's many great packages for designing path diagrams and graphing out results. Um, and you get all the benefits and flexibility of M plus for actually running your structural equation modeling. Um, and this is particularly useful if you have batches of model. So if you do a technique like growth mixture modeling, where you're running 10 different solutions with different number of latent classes, and you want to summarize them all against each other, you could create um, nice tables that just summarize your results. So I label this slide practical issues to think about as opposed to limitations, because I, these aren't necessarily limitations of SEM. These are more issues you need to think about if you do SEM analysis. So first, a researcher makes use of strong causal assumptions, again, which you need theory, li prior literature, and logic to, to really verify. Um, you really require a large sample size, given the large number of parameters we're going to be analyzing in the typical model. And the third thing is there's these potential model specification issues, which I'm going to get into next. Let's see if there's, I see a question, so how do you tell, oh, so really this is, Deciding if it's small, medium, or big, um, again, it, it's, it could be interpretive in terms of a correlation coefficient. So if you look at like a cone's effect size, that's what I use. Um, I typically use that criteria for deciding if it's small is usually less than 0.2. Um, medium is somewhere around 0.3 to 0.5, and then large is after that. Um, however, it, there is some things to think about your particular study and the, the nature of the, the measures you're using. So sometimes you'll stray from that criteria depending on your particular study. Um, the Adams, do you have any other thoughts on that? No, I, I think that's great. I just what I like about it is you know when it's standardized, it, you can think of that as zero to one. It's pretty straightforward in terms of you know. Yes, you've got the sort of typical way that people interpret that, but you know when you uh, when you when you have it like that in a standardized effect, it it puts it in an easy metric for me to think about. Mm -hmm. um, it is also worth noting, Doug, that you know people have developed a fair. If there are there are more complicated questions that'll come up or around effect sizes for things like indirect effects. You know, so in a model, there is a you know we have 
the extent to which X is influencing Z uh, through Y. Uh, okay. And then there are multi-level effect sizes. So not all of them are printed out uh, in just straight out um, in terms of the individual parameters there are, but as you're trying to think about other pieces or things like R squared, that there are, there are additional options uh, and I tend to find that those wind up in structural equation modeling, the journal. Uh, so that's another place that you can go look. Uh, I think social science and medicine has probably had a couple of them, but um, that's where I tend to find stuff. Uh, it's not social, sociology, sociological methods or whatever that one is. It's not social science and medicine, but uh, they're out there. But I think I agree with everything you said. Okay, great. So a really co important concept with SEM is this idea of model identifiability. Um, so really you could end up, you have this perfect data set you believe, you have valid and reliable measures, um, your data, your sample size is really big um, and you really carefully crafted your conceptual model with your team of researchers. And you end up, you input your code in M plus and you know you have no coding errors. Uh, it's really, there's no, nothing to back run there. And you receive a really confusing message that says the model is not identified. And so I can't give, offer you a solution. And really we're gonna decide to decipher this. Um, what model identifiability is, it's a condition where there exists a unique solution to the parameters in your model. So looking at my little examples here, if we start backwards with example two, and I offer you these two equations, we could solve for X and Y. So doing this, X equals three and Y equals negative two. There's this unique solution to the equations. If I look at example one, um, I could come up with lots of different solutions. So X could be three, Y could be four. X could be two, Y could be five and so on. Um, so there's no way I could solve example one that we could all come up with one solution for. However, we could solve example two. So, Again, this is not a question of sample size, data quality. If your model is non-identifiable, there's just no existence of a unique solution. And the idea in SEM is there's different conditions you have to satisfy in order to have a unique solution. So number one, in your degrees of three freedom for your chi-square test statistic must be non-negative. Um, all latent variables need to have a metric. So these are unobserved variables, so you need to assign them a mean and a variance. And these rules are necessary, but they're not yet sufficient conditions. So there's additional criteria, um, which we won't get into here, such as the rank and order condition that are both necessary and sufficient for identifiability. Um, well, we had a question sure. around sample size in relation probably was pop it, it's not exactly in relation to this but it feels in relation to this so sure. as you're talking through this are there any rules of samples rules of thumb for sample sizes so i'll give um, you the really brief rule and then i know adam Przinsky is going to get into this later on a little a little more um the really brief rule is that people say a sample size of 200 is the is uh, what's considered a typical SEM sample size. So you don't want too much less than that. Um, it's really in relation to the number of parameters you use. And there's always various SEM sample size calculators as well. But the bigger the sample, the better, of course. Um, and you're gonna have many, many parameters. So you, you like to have just really, really large sample sizes. but. Again, um, in a lot of books, they say 200 is the rule of thumb for like, this is a, a decent sample size to work with. Um, so getting into it, if you have negative degrees of freedom, your model is under identified. And 
this is problematic that there's no unique solution to your parameters and you'll get that error if you input it into software. A just identified model is exactly zero degrees of freedom. So here there's a unique solution. However, model fit measures are all trivial. So you'll get, if your degrees of freedom is zero, there's no meaningful model fit evaluation. You'll just get that your model is trivially a perfect fit. So the preference is always an over-identified model um, where you have positive degrees of freedom and that gives some meaning to model fit measures as well. Now to talk kind of the larger picture, um, you once you get experience with uh, applying SEM, you don't really think about model identifiability too much. So it's kind of a, this smooth process where you just sort of in your head know the rules a little bit of what you can and can't do. And you, you just apply it. Um, and you think about, I want to specify this model. Um, and if there's an error, um, you kind of look at smaller pieces of it sometimes and kind of decide what's the problem with that and how do we identify this model. So it's really this smooth ad hoc process as opposed to just formally, you know, analyzing rank and order conditions and figuring out the problems. So another model specification issue potentially is equivalent models. So in this case, you have different specifications, but they'll actually yield the same sample covariance matrix and the same set of parameters will be involved. So if you have the same sample covariance and the same model implied covariance, well, the models will have identical model fit. So there's no way to evaluate then which model is a better fit than the other. There's nothing statistically to evaluate. And I'll give you an example here. Um, is that this is from a real study of alcohol dependent individuals. So there's one specification where we say drinking intensity leads to depression, which leads to suicidal ideation. Um, but however, it's perfectly plausible to say, well, increased depression leads to more drinking intensity, which leads to suicidal ideation. So the, the idea is if, I pick either of these two models. What I did is I switched the directionality between drinking intensity and depression. Um, and there's nothing about that. Then I'll have the same set of parameters and number of parameters. And I have, still have the same sample covariance. And that will produce the exact same model fit, whichever model I use here. Um, so the answer picking between the two, there's nothing statistically I could do to choose between the two. Um, I could look at theory, logic, and prior literature and determine what specification I wanna use. Um, so the one we went with is the first one, given our sample was alcohol dependent individuals, our team of psychiatrists believe that in our sample, drinking intensity led to increased depression. Let's see, is there another question? Oh, we got that. Yep. So there's a, the other aspect I mentioned at the very beginning. There's many other uses of SEM um, in terms to to comparing models head to head um, in a confirmatory manner or to revise an initial model in a more exploratory manner and decide, come up with what's the best specification given your data. Um, and it all starts with, you could compare nested or ne non-nested models. So in models A and B, I could remove parameter C prime, I could restrict it to zero, and then I come up with another model. So model B is then, nested within model A. Um, I could Another thing I could do is I could add parameters. So in model C, I'm adding these different causal paths and new parameters 
So model C is actually a non-nested model. There's no way I could remove a parameter from model A and come up with model C. I also have to add parameters. So for nested models, you could use the chi-square test the difference and decide what specification works the best. So there's empirical criteria we can look at. Um, and for non-nested or nested model, there's all things you see in traditional statistics that also apply to SEM. So looking at AIC or BIC or adjustments to those different indices are useful. Um, BCC is a cross-validation technique. R square, it turns out, is not very useful in SEM. Um, basically, that's because we have multiple equations to where dependent variables are different in different equations. So you could get an R squared on one scale in one equation, and then it doesn't relate to a different equation. And then you're kind of left with um, making comparisons among very different R squares. What is very useful, and I believe Adam Carl will talk about this a little, is modification indexes, um, which help you evaluate local fit. So I went over a whole host of model fit criteria for a global fit of your whole model. Modification indexes help you look at single parameters and if they're useful for your model. So to conclude this theory portion, Model estimation and evaluation is really based on sound multivariate statistical theory. Um, and we really emphasize that model evaluation piece to establish internal validity of the model and just discuss something about the plausibility of our causal assumptions we're making. Um, model specification is really challenging and rewarding, especially in health and medicine. Um, where you really need to work with a team of experts um, and whatever the subject of your study is and come up with the best possible model specification for your study. Um, and there's just, SEM is very underutilized still in our fields and there's lots and lots of methods and applications work still to be done. So I'll pause for a second for any questions before turning it over to Adam Carl. Okay, if nothing further, I'll stop share and turn it over. Thanks, Doug. Uh, I also stuck one thing in the chat that I wanna mention in relation to sample size, which is uh, the ability to do Monte Carlo studies in M plus. Um, I, there's a great article that Linda wrote back in, two, Linda Enbank wrote in 2002 on how to use a Monte Carlo study to evaluate sample size for, M, uh, for structural equation modeling. Um, and that is really how I wind up doing everything. And it really, one of the things that I like about it uh, is it really forces you to think hard. Um, to, well, one of two things. It forces you to think hard about all of the, the parameters in your model. Um, and then the, usually the immediate follow-up thought up to that is just how little you probably really know, have any reasonable guess uh, for the pieces of your model. Uh, I like it too, because it, I've learned as many times as I've thought about and gone over things in SCM, every time I go to do a Monte, not every time at this point, but it felt like for a while, every time I did a Monte Carlo study, I couldn't get it to run right. And it was because I was forgetting to specify some path uh, I mean, you know, you have to put in a value for literally every single path, and, and even if it's just a guess. Uh, so I really learned a lot about what it meant to assume X, Y, or Z. Um, so if you're the kind of person that has fun with that, then you'll really enjoy Monte Carlo studies. If, uh, if you don't, then it'll just feel like banging your head against the wall. Um, it, is, it is also worth uh, mentioning, and I, I can talk about this within the context of um, measurement here in a minute, but when we think about sufficient sample size for SEM, there are a lot of ways to think about, do I have enough people? You know, one of them is, do you mean, do you have enough people to successfully reject 
the wrong model, right? So if the model you hypothesis hypothesize is wrong, do you have enough people to feel confident that you'll reject it? That's one half of that. But the flip side of that is, do you then have enough people to find, you know, what might be the appropriate model in there, or at least a hint at it? And that could be a very different thing. So your the appropriate sample size to correctly reject a single factor model is going to be a lot smaller than the appropriate size you're going to need to feel good about sorting through, say, what suppose that's a five factor model. Um, so there, there's a lot to think about uh, in, a, in a lot of, I mean, I know that we're all statisticians here, so we're both faced with people asking us for rule of thumbs and simultaneously trying to explain why they're horrible. Um, I think in, in SEM, those rules of thumb are really based around just having enough people to estimate the parameters, which is not the same thing as having enough people to feel confident that you've recovered the, the population parameters well, or have the ability to modify your model without feeling like it's just sample specific. So I know that was a whole lot of stuff right there, but I wanted to make sure I mentioned that. All right, so let me open up my slides here. Measurement. Okay, uh, so I want to spend some time talking about measurements um, built into that. I'm going to spend a little time talking about why you should care about measurement. Um, I have to admit that, you know, I, I want to say from the first time I learned that measurement is something you could study, it's something that has interested me. It may not be quite that early in my academic career, or career isn't even the right word. I, I mean, just like my learning career, uh, but it is awfully close. Uh, for sure, when I learned that IRT was a thing, so I was probably a sophomore or a junior and as an undergraduate. I was just fascinated and was all in to understanding modeling. Um, so having said that, uh, I feel like it's always good to stop back, take a moment and step back and talk a little bit about why measurement's important. Uh, and then I wanna talk about measurement models in a little bit more detail. We're gonna talk about dimensionality and internal validity and measurement bias in terms of multi-group studies. Uh, I'm gonna do all of this within most of, most of this within the context of an ongoing project I have right now. And I, I do that in part to um, help orient you to the steps that we're going through. And, and they're always, there are always a lot of good questions. And for me, it's really fresh in my mind why we did X, Y, or Z. So I'm gonna do it within in a, that example. So as we've already mentioned, surveys and patient reported outcome measures um, are often used in, in health and medicine. And these indirectly measure the health statuses and behaviors of the participants and the individual patients in our study. Uh, unfortunately, this is fallible self-report data. Uh, it's incredibly easy um, to not answer a question well. Uh, you know, I, I, I give a couple examples of this when I'm thinking about the importance of measurement. Uh, but, but one of them is, for those of you that are in any sort of a long-term relationship, um, Think how difficult it is sometimes to communicate with somebody you know really well. Uh, we are often in the, in, you know, I can't tell you the number. It took me, so I've been married for you know, 26 years, been dating my wife since we were 13. So it's going to be 35 years next year. And in spite of that, it probably took me 15 or 20 years to realize that when my wife says, when you have a chance, she really means right now, right? So we are in the process of, asking people questions uh, in health and medicine often when they're under stress at the clinic, um, maybe you know, have some serious uh, physical or psychological issue going on. And we wanna ask them a bunch of questions, the fewest questions possible and get good data. Um, and the, the fact of the matter is it's really hard to do that well. Um, so self-report data are really difficult. Um, 
there. So that's an issue of validity, but you also get into the issues of reliability. I have had data where a child's gender flips back and forth across time. Um, so, you know, the, the even things that we think should be very easy to report on often get reported wrong. So that's one really important issue that happens with this data. The second thing that happens is many of you may have hit is there's often a desire to take a bunch of question, responses to questions and aggregate them into some type of single score. Um, the example, one of the things we're gonna talk about today is a summary measure of fluoride hesitancy. A fluoride hesitancy is that when, if you had kids and you take them to the dentist or your dentist has probably done it to you, they paint fluoride on your teeth. Uh, they like to tell, tell you that it's like vitamins for your teeth. Uh, there are a fair number of parents that are uncomfortable with fluoride uh, in the same way that there seems to be a large number of people who are uncomfortable with the vaccine. This kind of concept of hesitancy and refusal is a lot more in the news lately. And we have a grant funded by the NIH to develop a measure of fluoride hesitancy. And one of the first questions right out of the gate was, can we create a single measure of fluoride hesitancy from the way that people answer questions? Um, yeah. So we, I will, we'll get to that towards the end. And I, so there's a question about power and that, but we will, I'll, I'll get to that at the end so I can go through this, but I see it. So those two pieces together lead to multiple challenges. Um, one of the questions is, do the scales items elicit reliable responses? And another question is, do the items measure the construct as hypothesized? Now, I really want to be clear on what I'm asked when I'm what that one is talking about, and we'll go into it in a lot of detail because it turns out to be a place where I spend a lot of my time thinking is not yet are we asking, are we measuring what we think we're measuring? But instead, if we think that, say, physician quality is a single construct and we write items or select items to measure that, um, they should, our structural equation model, the measurement part, should show that those items only measure a single construct, regardless of what that construct is. So that's that second question there. Do the items measure the construct as hypothesized? Is it valid? Um, is it valid to create a single score from the item responses? And if not, what is a valid way to score the items? And should one create a score at all? So, you know, one, one alternative to this, and it's a a um, soapbox that I've been standing on within the patient report outcome measurement information system promise collective for a while now is I'm not always, I, I'm very rarely sure why people are using measurement modeling to output in this case, what you might think of as a factor score and then using that factor score in later analyses uh, and subsequent analyses. It really makes a lot more sense to do a full SEM uh, in part because some research has shown that you can get spurious results, uh, but also uh, some of the features that you get out of doing the measurement modeling are lost when you just output a score. Um, Adam, there's I, some questions in the chat if you want to. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to get to them in one sec. Uh, okay, just me. The, the, the last question I would say is, do the items measure what they're intended to measure? Now, this is that latter concept of, if I'm measuring physician quality, do the items really measure physician quality? Whereas the first one was, I think they measure a single construct. Do they seem in fact to measure a single construct? This later question is, is that construct the thing that I think it is? What's great about SEM is that it can directly address all of these questions that I've listed here uh, about reliability and validity. So this, this question about power, I'm gonna shift that uh, or about percentages of things and about power analysis. I think we'll, we'll shift that to the end. Um, Fran asked a question about developing, from developing scales, how many participants is a good number for pilot stage focus groups? It's a great question. And I wanna, uh, two pieces to that. One is all of what I'm presenting today is, uh, as I talk about this forward hesitancy, uh, I wanna make sure that you all know that we did do a lot of qualitative work with parents and clinicians uh, this will be the work that I'm talking about is after that. Um, I, I only mention that because at least until probably the last 10, maybe 20 years, 20 years at this point, um, there was often a tendency for people to say, I'm an expert, therefore this is correct. And fortunately, we've moved to a place 
of doing a lot more qualitative work to understand uh, how patients and others interpret things. So Fran's question then is, okay, great. I would like to do that. How do I know what is a good number? There is no great answer to that. What I can tell you is it, it depends on a couple of things. There are typically at least a couple of qualitative phases that we do in item development. One is a more theoretical uh, sitting down with people, trying to understand what a con what, how they view depression or how they view physician quality. How do they view fluoride hesitancy? What is that experience for them? Um, that is one set of sample size you might be doing. Then there's a second step that after you've written items based on what people have said there, you would do cognitive interviewing to, un to make sure that the item that you wrote is conveying what you think it is, or hope it is at least, from a qualitative standpoint. The, the first one um, tends to be in, so it depends on how many people you want to include, but I would say at least 15 or 20. Um, the, the better answer to that, um, if I were writing a grant, which I have multiple times, what I would say is what you're looking for is saturation. And what saturation is, is when you, you're asking questions and you're not getting any new concepts. Uh, and you would stop after say the second or third interview where you've reached saturation. So what we tend to do in our, in our the qualitative section of our grants is give a number like say 15 or 20. Um, then we say, say what really what we're gonna do is we're gonna go after saturation and we will keep including people until we reach saturation. Um, you can usually, you could probably get by with a fewer people for cognitive interviews because you're not really after that saturation. So I hope that's a good, a good answer to that. Um, another answer to that is you, you really want a qualitative expert on your team. I'm only talking about this from having worked with qualitative people. So measurement models use equations to describe um, how individuals respond to questions. There's a follow-up question about saturation. Um, my experience is usually about 20 people um, is how I would say that. Um, it can differ if you have kids and, and I would really recommend getting a qualitative expert because um, they are much better at eliciting the concepts as well as interpreting the themes and, and doing that analysis. That part, I don't have much, you know, any actual boots on the ground uh, having run that. Um, so measurement models use equations to describe how individuals respond to questions. The measurement model is just a part of SEM. Uh, you've heard it, us talk about it a few different times today. Confirmatory factor analysis, just a, just a small part of SEM. Uh, you've also heard us talk about multiple group models. Um, I, I think we've talked about multiple, multiple indicator, multiple cause models. You do a multiple group, multi, a multiple indicator, multiple cause model, also a type of measurement model. If you've heard about item response theory, uh, it turns out that most, but not all, uh, IRT models can be re-expressed in an SEM form, which is what I do. Uh, I, I just do everything. I do my all of my IRT. All, Yes, I do all of my IRT analyses within SEM. Um, not all of them can be done that way. Increasingly, uh, those challenges have been overcome. And some of those challenges have been overcome by adding in the mixture modeling component where you have a latent categorical variable as well. Um, but the general IRT models that um, most non-measurement people hit can easily be re-expressed. Uh, with an SEM. And in, in some very simple cases, M plus will just do it for you. Uh, we'll spit that out on an, on an IRT metric for you. So we're going to look at a picture real quickly. Uh, you're probably thinking to yourself, this is the same thing you showed me before. Uh, there are a few differences in this picture, and we'll talk about what each of the pieces are and what they mean. But I want to draw your attention to the fact that before we had just squares and a large circle and some arrows. Now we've got a whole new set of stuff in there. Uh, and since we're statisticians, we should prove our statistical worth by putting up some equations and, and things like that. And Doug has already done a lot of that for us, uh, but it's always, I always like to put it up a little bit here. Really what I'm saying here is that we, we have an observed response, yj, that equals the ith individual score response, whatever you want to call it, 
on the Jth ordered categorical item. And we're going to let the number of items range from one to P, and the number of response, the responses will range from zero to S. Um, we're going to talk about this, start motivate this in terms of ordinal data, uh, but please note, you'll see, we're going to get a few couple of slides in, and you're going to see something that looks really similar to what Doug has already put up there. So the, the, um, the, the ordinal and the, and the continuous flow right into each other. So when we have ordinal data, what we're going to do is assume that there's a continuous latent response variant, Y star, that uh, determines the observed responses. So if we come back to this picture, here what we're saying is, these are the observed responses that fall into categories, never, sometimes, usually, always. But even though the observed data are ordinal, we're going to make the assumption that underlying that ordinal data is some latent response variant that is continuous. We, we're calling it a latent response variant because it's really just this small little thing here. It's not really a factor in the larger sense that we mean it. We're really just saying that um, when we ask somebody about a behavior, how often do you cry? Uh, they can cry, you know, have near, near zero levels of crying up to near constant levels of crying. Uh, even though we've asked them to coarsely categorize their own behavior into four or five categories. And then what we, what we do is we assume that there is a threshold that governs the observed response. And so if Y star, that latent response variant, is less than the threshold, uh, then you'll respond in one category. And if Y star is greater than that threshold, you'll respond in at least the next highest category. Uh, so we have a set of parameters that correspond to those threshold parameters. And in this picture, these arrows represent those threshold parameters. Right? It's the idea that as you move along levels of this latent response area, you're more and more likely to respond in, in higher and higher categories on the item itself. Now, hopefully what you're looking at here looks awfully familiar to you from what Doug put up. We have Y star relating to the factors through some intercepts and, and uh, factor values and loadings and epsilons. But notice that where Doug had Y, we now have Y star. But the rest of this is very similar. So if you have continuous data, Y star just simplifies to Y. That's the, the connection between those two. So we have a set of latent intercept parameters. These are similar to the intercepts in a regression. Uh, they're giving you uh, the average value of the item response of the latent response variant at the average value of the latent variable. We also have factor loadings. These are almost identical to correlations, especially if you're interpreting them on the standard, the completely standardized metric. And they represent how strongly the latent response variant relates to the factors. They're strongly related to reliability. And so when the uh, loadings are zero, you're essentially saying that none of the variance in the items and the item responses is explained by the underlying latent variable. It can't predict it at all. So your people's responses are, should be all over the place, very unreliable. As the loadings get closer and closer to one, the standardized loadings, you're essentially saying that all of the variance in the, in the items is attributable to the factor. So the consistency within item responses should get very, very good. So in this picture now, we don't have the intercepts because we're, we're running out of room on our picture, but these arrows here represent the loadings. Then of course, we also have uh, the individual's level of the latent variables. Uh, and then we have epsilon, which is the variance not attributable to the factors. And this includes things like measurement error. This is really, these, these, these are in some ways a catch-all because whenever we ask people questions, we're both measuring the latent variable that we're interested in and frankly, a little bit, we're measuring their ability to read, right? Uh, so almost every more complex math question is asking about your ability to read, you know, your a knowledge about math, but also in there is how your ability to read. So measurement error is both reliability, which gets into you know, just 
if, if people are paying attention, random measurement error, but also more specific aspects of measurement error. And that's what these arrows here are for. They represent the error terms. And they're also called uniquenesses, uh, if you've heard that term, or residual variance. So then we're finally getting out to this population covariance uh, matrix. We have a matri matrix of factor variances and covariances. And then we have this matrix of uniquenesses. Now in measurement modeling, this is specified as diagonal, almost always oops, um, specified as diagonal. If you've heard the term local dependence, independence before, that's, this, that's where that gets specified in that matrix. It is the concept that once I condition on levels of a latent variable, there should be no more correlation among the items, item responses. Uh, it is something, it is a specification that we can relax as we move along and we'll talk about that and I'll show some examples of that today. Uh, but if your measure has, if you have a lack of local independence, you have a measure that has problems. Uh, so that is, it is why we specify it that way in the measurement modeling piece. So as I mentioned earlier, we often use sets of equations to measure a single construct. Now we, we may have several sets um, on a single measure or a survey or questionnaire measuring multiple constructs. So, um, and what psychometricians call internal validity exists if empirical data support the hypothesized relationship between the items and the underlying constructs. This is the notion that I meant before. You have a hypothesis about how the items measure an underlying construct. And internal, internal validity exists if the data support our hypothesis. And scoring systems should have internal validity for the scores to have meaning. And the reason this is important, so let's just briefly talk about that position quality um, example that I gave earlier. So imagine we're, oh, excuse me. Imagine that we have a, uh, a measure that is evaluating clin clinicians' quality. And five of the questions ask about things like my clinician listens to me, uh, I feel like she understands me. And then five of the questions are about, you know, I'm, I'm able to get appointments quickly. I don't have to wait when I come in. Uh, and then you get somebody like uh, a Doug who's got a fabulous bedside manner and uh, great at listening, really has strong cultural competence. But Doug works in a really busy um, inner city clinic. So it takes a long time to see him. There are long waits when you come in. So Doug is going to score really high on the first five items, really low on the next five items. And then you get Adam Prime. Uh, so, you know, he's just, you know, a, a country club boy, coasted through life, <laughs> horrible bedside manner, but he's, he's living it up in a really nice wealthy suburb. So you can get appointments quickly. You don't have long waits. So he's going to do really poorly on those first five questions, really great on the next five questions. And if we put the summarize the scores for those two individuals, they're going to come up looking identical, uh, except they're really quite different people. And so if we hypothesized that, the, that there was a single quality measure, our scores would essentially have no meaning because we would have taken two separate constructs, uh, your interpersonal skills and ability and your clinical quality and smashed them into a single score. So it's really critical uh, that we evaluate this. This isn't just though for scoring, it is also for when we move to a larger structure equation model. Uh, models. We typically look at the measurement components first because we want to make sure that any misfit that we see in our larger structure equation model isn't because we're wrong about how the latent variables relate to each other, uh, is only because we're, uh, we've misspecified the latent variable part the relationships, the structural part. We don't want misfit to show up uh, because we've misspecified the measurement model and we would get spurious findings for that matter as well. So let's talk about uh, fluoride hesitancy and the steps we went through in this project. So fluoride hesitancy, I mentioned what it is earlier. It's when parents are express resistance towards getting fluoride for their children's teeth. Uh, Donald Chi, my colleague at the University of Washington, has done some work to tie this to vaccine hesitancy. 
And the idea, the hope is that we can identify people who are fluoride hesitant, um, tackle their fluoride hesitancy, and on a less um, button pushing issue versus vaccine hesitancy, and those two, the, the things that lead to fluoride hesitancy are probably very similar. And so we might reduce vaccine hesitancy through kind of a backdoor. So we did the qualitative work that Fran was asking about earlier, really important to do that work. Uh, Todd, who's at the University of Washington, just a, a really fabulous team of people who interviewed um, several parents, multiple parents, talked to some clinicians. Um, and we started out this project expecting that fluoride hesitancy was not a single hesitancy construct, but it was an open question. Uh, at the end of our qualitative work, we'd noticed that five themes had really seemed to emerge. Uh, a theme around trust, uh, a theme around harm, a theme around chemical exposure. Uh, those sound similar, but they were different in the sense that you had people who were really concerned that fluoride caused harm. And then a separate, separate theme was people who just didn't like exposure to chemicals, didn't have it rooted in concerns about harm. Uh, people who were not confident about the certainty of the, the research, uh, these are probably the people who these days are saying, I just need to do my own research uh, here on the news all the time. Uh, and then another group of people who didn't feel that fluoride was a necessity. So those are the five themes. We, we weren't sure if these were their own constructs that needed to be measured in and of their own right, or just similar to item content like depression, where you have somatic components of depression and cognitive components of depression, but really one overarching depression construct. So these were our two main models. Uh, I always, for those of you that are doing measurement modeling, even when uh, multiple constructs are hypothesized, uh, always test uh, the single factor model. Um, more than once, uh, it has turned out that the single factor model fit the data just as well sometimes even better, and is a much more parsimonious um, explanation. So we did this using factor analysis. So we tested the fit of a measurement model using CFA. Uh, as Doug has talked about, we use these goodness of fit indices. If they don't support the model, uh, it may be that model modifications are needed. It's also possible that we need an entirely different model. Now, that is a packing a whole lot into two little bullet points. Um, we will talk about, you know, we will go through and talk about some of the things that I did. It is not, I don't know if this is the right way to use a zero sum game, but model fit is not it's always a zero sum thing where you set out and you say it didn't fit, so I'm wrong entirely. Because we have so many components to the model, you know, we could be essentially right but a little bit wrong in some specific local places. And that's where Doug mentioned before the difference between global fit indices like the RMSEA, the CFI and the TLI and local fit indices that might tell us where the misfit that we're observing in the global fit indices is where the source of that. Uh, it's not the same as like post hoc analyses after an, an, a significant ANOVA, but it's a somewhat uh, conceptually similar concept. So just in case you haven't gotten the message yet, a model that measurement model that fits well is critical for both scoring as well as doing your SDM. So this is just an expansion of the same figure we had up earlier, trying to show you that this model, single factor model with 33 items would look like this. If we had more space, you'd have all 33 squares up here. Oops, that was weird. All right. So that's the unidimensional model. It indicates that the items measure a single fluoride hesitancy construct. When we fit that model, uh, the RMSEA was 0.13. Its confidence interval was pretty tight around that. So that immediately is telling us that it's not gonna fit well enough to fly in any journal. Uh, it doesn't fit well, but it also tells us that it's not an atrocious fit, right? That's when we were getting at earlier that we, we we have some concepts about what's, you know, we're, we're not super far off the mark necessarily. Our CFI was 0.92 and our TLI was 0.91. Both of those are above that 0.9 threshold. Uh, but given that the standardized root mean square residual and the RMSEA 
are well above their thresholds, um, we're going to say this model isn't, doesn't fit well. But when I'm doing a single factor model like this, and particularly in measurement modeling, one of the things that I will do is I will look through the modification indices for extremely large modification indices. So a modification index can be interpreted as the change in the chi-square fit given uh, a relaxation of a constraint. So we mentioned earlier uh, that, that in, in the single factor model, really the only set of constraints that we have here is, is that we don't allow any of these uniquenesses to correlate. Now, if there's multidimensionality, it's going to show up if we specify a single factor model and it's not actually a single factor model. One of the ways that we would see that is large patterns of, of modification indices that suggest lots of correlated uniquenesses. Those correlated uniquenesses are correlating because there is in fact another factor out there. What I'm talking about here is, were there any examples of local dependence that were substance, large and substantive, maybe affecting my fit? And so to be clear, you can interpret a uh, modification index with one degree of freedom. I'm, I'm usually a little leery about that because you know, if you have 33 items, you have a lot of um, modification indices, so you're liable to make a type one error. So I tend to look in the 10 to 20 range if I'm really interested in those at the lower level. What I'm talking about here is scanning the modification indices for numbers in the two or 300 range. You know, clearly an impactful, large uh, source of misfit. And that's what I saw. I saw a couple of items that seem to have really large um, local dependence. Now, this is I'm just doing this from my experience. Um, that when, I'm, when I see that, what that suggests to me is that there are one or two items, sets of items that have local dependence over and above any potential multidimensionality that I failed to model. So I relaxed those two constraints and the uniquenesses. Uh, didn't really improve my fit all that much. It improved it a little bit, but not enough to make me think, oh, I really have a unidimensional model here that in fact, um, I probably have something else. So it didn't resolve problematic fit. It was worth checking. So then we moved to the qualitative model. Now this is the five factor model that I mentioned earlier. Now I wanna draw your attention to the fact that in this particular example, we are hypothesizing that these items only measure this latent variable. And these items only measure the harm latent variable. And these items only measure the certainty latent variable. So the arrows are only going to one latent variable. Uh, if we allowed cross-loading, so when we say that, when we have a loading that goes from to one, uh, loading for one latent variable, and then we have um, potentially the item is also going over to this latent variable, right? So we have an arrow to this one, from this one, and an arrow from this. We will wind back up in that situation that I was talking about earlier, though slightly different, where if someone said yes, to this item, it's measuring a little bit of this latent variable and a little bit of this latent variable. And that's problematic from a scoring standpoint, because now we don't know if there sometimes is driven by their level of this latent variable or their level of this latent variable. So from developing a measure standpoint, you're, you're going to want to develop items that don't have cross loadings. It, what I'm some of the things I'm talking about here are constraints you might relax if suppose somebody gave you a data set and they hadn't done a lot of work on the measurement side, the qualitative side, all those components, uh, and you were just trying to come up with uh, a measurement model. You might wind up with cross loadings if you were only going to do an SEM versus develop a measure. So the five factor model with no cross loadings indicates that the items measure five separate constructs. Um, the, the model fit was better, certainly improved. Uh, these guys, this is up in the quote ideal range. This is certainly very close. This is getting close to acceptable. Our MSEA still isn't great. Uh, one of the things I noticed is it's that among four of the correlations, among four of the factors were relatively highly correlated. 
And it doesn't mean that there is in fact a two factor model, but it suggests that it might exist. So if I take a single factor model, a single factor, and I take that item set for that single factor, and I split it into four separate factors, I'm not going to atrociously affect my fit uh, as long as I let the factors correlate, but the correlations will be quite high. So it suggests the possibility that maybe I should put them back together and see if this was in fact the model. Uh, that didn't really change anything and the fit got a tiny little bit worse, um, but I wanted to do it. So there are things that you do while you're developing measures or developing a measurement model that you do to convince yourself that you're not taking the path of least resistance or that you haven't explored more, more parsimonious explanations. So now what I did is I said, okay, I, let's stick with that first five factor model that we had. But instead of looking for a problematic model, changing our model, maybe it was that some of the items in my model that we had weren't good. So we're back to this approach. But now what we're asking is maybe misfit is resulting partly from items being problematic, not because we don't have the right number of factors or other things. So we, one of the things we noticed is that one of the items had a near zero loading. And this was trust, I trust my dentist to give me a choice. Now on the surface, that felt like a trust question to us, uh, but this was, this was more about um, feeling like you had the, the, you would be given a choice. That's what we noticed versus the general idea of trusting your dentist. So there were people, what we were finding is there were people who didn't have a lot of trust for the dentist or for the dentistry field, but were still convinced that they would be given a choice. Uh, so we dropped that item. We also noticed that there were still some local dependents. We had those item pairs that I mentioned earlier. Those giant MIs didn't go away. Uh, so we dropped one of those items from each pair and we just took them completely out of the model and stopped using them. Um, and then one of the items mo uh, modification in this East suggested a cross-loading. This idea that topical fluoride is unhealthy for my child. Uh, it seemed to go for both the harm and the necessity one. Uh, so we dropped that item, again, because we wanted to be able to have item responses measuring a single construct. So then we wanted to look at our fit. So the, the model itself looks the same. We didn't modify the model. We dropped items that, we didn't, that didn't fit well in the model. Um, now what you'll see is our fit indices have really gotten into the range of where we would accept, we would feel comfortable with this model. Now notice that the RMSDA is still not quite below 0.08. For us, we were able, we felt good about stopping here. Uh, and the reason for that is twofold. Um, well, primarily, uh, I, or, well, there are two reasons. But one of the reasons is, when I was saying earlier, is a very, there's a lot packed into those two bullet points. All of the things that I just talked about today are the kinds of things that a psychometr psychometrician would feel were very reasonable uh, approaches to misfit that you, that you most psychometricians. Uh, you want to avoid though, just trying to get, trying to relax as many possible constraints as you can to get good fit, right? We've moved away from theory. We've moved away from making small modifications um, to really changing things. I kind of liken the small modifications as to you know, when you're trying to bolt something together and you just, it's not that you're bolting the wrong piece to another piece. It's just, you gotta shake it a little bit to line up the screw holes. Um, it's, it's not a great analogy, but it's kind of close to that. Then the other reason that we were, we were comfortable stopping here is, so we are collecting another data set. So this was, this is about 700 parents. And um, we've spent the last six months or so, I think it's been about six months. It might've been five collecting data from another thousand um, parents. Uh, I wouldn't have felt like we needed a thousand, but uh, I think later, Adam will say this to you. So I, I hate to steal your thunder, Adam, but you always, more is always better. Uh, so when Donald asked me how many I wanted, I asked him instead, how many can we get in the time we have? He said a thousand and I said, that's how many we need. So that's how, for those of you asking questions about sample size, that's what I went for. So we will then 
once we get that new data, in fact, I just got an email about that, um, that the data collection just stopped, um, we will go in and drop the items that we had talked about and fit this last model just the way it is and start there. Uh, so we have, uh, you know, we're validating it in a, that model in a separate sample. But I want to show you two more models based on this five factor model for a couple of reasons. One, um, given some of those high correlations among the factors, there is, the, there is a suggestion that maybe there is a general hesitancy construct. Uh, and there are two ways that we could think about that. The first is called the bi factor model. It's been popular, not popularized, repopularized by Steve Reese and others. Um, um, I've had a tiny hand in that, but uh, not like Steve has. Um, it posits that there is a general hesitancy construct, but it allows specific, potentially non-substantive factors. And the benefit of this model is that the general factor has a direct effect on item responses. So here's, here's what I mean. I know that looks like a really complicated model. And I also would note that it's not a technically correct these arrows down here should be going up to latent response variant, but then you wouldn't be able to see everything and it just gets really messy. So in this model, what we're saying is there is in fact, we're hypothesizing, there is in fact a general underlying hesitancy construct that we could score and get a single meaningful score on, but it doesn't fully account for the covariance among the items and that specific little factors will account for the remaining covariance among the items. And what usually, but not always happens is you need these factors to account if, if the model fits well, you need these factors to account for leftover, sorry, it's doing this, covariance among the items, but they're not substantive. The loadings uh, on these factors are usually very low. If you wanted to get a subscale score, it would be a very unreliable subscale score. But that is not always the case. And Steve has some great papers out there talking about ways to evaluate whether you can get good scores off of all these different places. The key thing here is that if you wanted to get an overall score, you can get it directly from the item responses. Yeah. But then there's also an alternative, uh, which some of you may have seen uh, and may be more familiar with, which is a higher order model. And it posits that there's a general hesitancy construct uh, that causes the five individual factors, which in turn cause the item responses. So what that is gonna look like is this, right? So we have the same five factor model up here, but the general hesitancy construct doesn't directly impact the items. Instead, it directly impacts the factors and those in turn go here. The consequence of this, if this model fits well or better than the five factor model is that you need to get scores on these, if you were doing this for scoring versus SEM, you would wanna get scores on each of these and then to get the hesitancy, the overall construct it would be some sort of weighted composite of your scores on these five factors. So first we tested the fit of the, uh, I'll do this here, just a sec, yeah. So I, I, what I didn't mention here is when this bi-factor model didn't fit well uh, and it didn't fit better. So we moved on to this higher factor, higher order model. Uh, you'll see that the fit is nearly identical. Uh, that's because really with four highly correlated factors here, uh, and even this one was still like 0.6, uh, we're, we're not really testing a lot here. We don't have a lot of room for this not to fit well. Uh, so. While there is, so the model suggests that there is a higher order factor, I would return to this though and say, yeah, it fits well, but suppose we were missing one or two things out this way. Um, it really could be two factors. We just don't have enough uh, bandwidth on individual factors to determine whether this single factor is useful or not. Um, but it still suggests that it could be. So that's the larger process that I go through and some examples of different models I test uh, in, in measurement modeling. And I wanna to touch on one other quick concept here, which is measurement bias. And it refers to the possibility that individuals with identical health respond dissimilarly to questions about their health as a function of their race or ethnicity. 
individuals with identical health statuses from different backgrounds may in fact respond differently or have a tendency to respond differently to questions about their health. They should respond similarly, but they don't. Uh, I know that's a, it's a kind of difficult question to understand, concept to understand. The way I think about, uh, the example I could give about this is, you know, men and women are socialized about crying quite differently, uh, certainly in uh, Western countries. And as I mentioned, my wife and I have been together for a very long time. I'd say we're about equivalent in terms of our depression or happiness or both, because they're not exactly the same construct. Many um, measures of depression ask questions about crying. Uh, I cried when my daughter was born, uh, when my dog died, uh, when a good friend died about 25 years ago. Don't cry a lot. My wife can tear up at a Hallmark commercial or when she sees a particularly sad looking bulldog. Uh, so she's going to say almost always, or very frequently on a question about crying, I'm going to say almost never. And yet our underlying values on the latent variable are actually really close. Right? So that's measurement bias, differential item functioning, systematic measurement error. Um, the items don't work the same way for two different people. Um, measurement equivalence denotes equal endorsement probabilities for individuals with equal construct values. Group membership does not predict measurement differences. I think it's really important to note here that here we're, we're only talking about differences in the measurement parameters. We are full, very happy uh, if or fine with the fact that the means on the latent variables would differ between men and women. The predictors of depression might be different for men and women. Here, what we're talking about is our, the way we measure depression should have an equal endorsement probabilities. And honestly, it's, it, it's not a super difficult thing to do. Um, and I, I, I like being able to say that because in a room full or a virtual room full of statisticians, we can say things like, well, all we do is subscript the parameters for group differences. I know a lot of people would hate that statement, but I think a lot, we, a lot of us are comfortable with that. So essentially all we're doing is we're creating a model for each group. And what we wanna know is, is this loading, if I constrain this loading and this loading, so these should be the same items, to equality in the same group, does that result in poor fit? And the way we do this in practice, uh, I'm gonna skip this, I wanna make sure Adam has enough time. The way we do this in practice is we use a series of hierarchically nested models. Well, I typically start out with the most free model. I okay, had that one earlier, free loadings, free thresholds, et cetera. And I look at the fit of that. If, if my fit falls apart there, it really means that you're measuring things fundamentally differently in the two groups. Uh, we have seen that with the measures of coping. Uh, when we've looked at a measure of coping that was developed in like middle-class white folks in the 70s and 80s, and then they went and collected data on uh, migrants into Texas and Arizona and Spanish speaking migrants. And their concept of coping was completely different. It was just a different factor model entirely. Then you're done, you're out. You're not measuring the same constructs. Uh, but typically we don't get to that point if it's a well-developed measure. Um, then you would say that, that fits well enough. Now let's, let's constrain the loadings to equality, see if that works. If that works, you move to seeing if the threshold are equivalent. And if you get to the end of that process and you have equivalent parameters, then you can feel confident that measurement equivalence exists. In an SEM context versus a scoring context, you might allow, if you found measurement bias, you might allow some of those parameters to vary across the groups because you're really only interested in that structural part. Well, not only, but you're not trying to output scores for people or come up with an item that'll work well for lots of different people. You're really just trying to understand the underlying relationships. So in conclusion, reliable and valid measurement is critical for good science. It's critical for developing a good structural equation model. Um, and SEM offers a potent method to evaluate the measurement properties of instruments. And it's also critical for the a valid fuller SEM. So I'm gonna stop there. Um, sorry, my whole family uh, and foster kids just got home, so it's a little loud. Um, I want to, I know we still have an outstanding question about power, but I want to 
make sure we get to any measurement questions that there are, uh, if there are any, um, and make sure that uh, we have time for a break and Doug and Adam to get to their stuff. Going once, going twice, Doug's coming on. All right, so I'm gonna briefly address yeah. this question from John. John asks, uh, this is a difficult question, but assuming you have to guess for some per percentage of parameters, at what point do you become concerned whether your power analysis is meaningful? It's a great question. What he's getting at is when I was mentioning Monte Carlo design, you, you have to guess about a lot of the paths often. And John, what I do instead of, instead of just full out guessing, the way I try and do that is reframe that and say to myself, all right, what, what is the smallest effect that I would care about? And then that lets me start to put pieces together. Uh, and then I will also do things like, oh, if I let these two correlations um, be higher, would that negatively impact my power? And if so, then I'll push those up. So it's less a percentage and more of a focus on trying to think about, well, what's the, what's the smallest effect size that I care about? Um, and then trying to build the, the different pieces of the model around that kind of thinking. Um, and, and frankly, it's gonna depend on each of your, uh, you know, the, the components of, your, um, of what you're studying. And that, so it's not an easy answer. Um, if I felt like I had no good way to evaluate or guess at the parameters um, for my main outcome of interest, I might be concerned, but I, but I frankly, uh, and I think Doug and Adam can attest to this too. One of the things I think that happens in SEM is it forces people. So we get, you might get flack from a reviewer who says, you've, you know, you've made several unreasonable assumptions. And what I find is that we get flack for that in SEM because of the way we do SEM, we have to be very specific about what things we allowed to correlate it what things that we zeroed out, what and, and how those assumptions play out in our actual data or in our actual model. And so then we tend to state them in our article and then people ding us for that. But in you know, multiple regression, when was the last time somebody said to you, uh, is it reasonable for you to assume that all the variables are measured perfectly without error and work perfectly well for everyone? I suspect that none of you have ever been get, gotten that criticism when in fact that is an assumption that you are making but because everyone uses it, you don't have to make that assumption. So I don't think it's necessarily worse. Uh, it's just that you start to get that fuzzy feeling because you realize how what kinds of assumptions you're making. All right, I think we're up an, to a half hour break now. That was you have an awesome to say, answer. Adam? Yeah, that was a great, great That was a good answer. I, I mean, I think the same thing, like, right. So if I'm doing one of these power simulations, it's exactly like Adam said, like um, I might have to, you know, some of the boundaries on the parameters that you program in your simulation might feel a little bit arbitrary as you're programming them, but they're no less, arbitrary than the ones that are pre-selected for you by the other power calculator that you use. And so the, so as long as you're transparent about the method that you use um, and that you're, you know, you're sort of putting an investment in, in thinking through the steps, I, I think that, that that approach is every bit as good as any other. Yeah. yeah and I, I just want to add one more thing because I have the, this great SEM calculator um, for power. Um, and it's based on a minimum number of parameters. So you just need to know the number of latent variables, the number of observed variables, and then one effect size um, that you're interested in. So it's it's real general calculator that seems to work real well, you know, for under very plausible assumptions you, you would have for your study. Um, of course, as they're mentioning, the more details you have, the better. So if you know all your parameters, you could do these really sophisticated Monte Carlo techniques. 
but if you really only know like one effect size or something you're working with and you conceptually can map out the latent variables you're studying and the observed variables you're studying, this calculator works very nicely and I've used it on very many grant applications at this point. And it's in the chat if you. Did you chat it to everybody, Doug, or to like? Oh, I, I'm sorry. It just went. Yeah, because I don't see it. Yeah, <laughs> let me just. I, you know, one other thing that I think is worth mentioning, John, it, it doesn't answer your uh, how many parameters question, but I do want to say that one of the ways that I find the M plus manual, what comes with it's not the manual. So the M plus manual has a whole bunch of it, you have manual, a whole bunch of examples. Then they have the code to run those examples with some example data. And then in a separate folder, they have the Monte Carlo code that they use to create all of those examples. I would not have been able to ever get started beyond very simple Monte Carlo stuff without that. So it is, it is a wonderful feature of, of mm -hmm. M plus that they show you how they made the data for the examples that they use. And because the, that, that manual covers so many of the things you're going to want to do, it, it can at least get you started in thinking about um, you know, how you might start setting up your Monte Carlo model. Okay, so I think we're going to take a 30 minute break. Uh, it's only 1130 where you guys are, I think, or I can't remember it is Kansas move over and in, into mountain time. Yeah, it's a 1126 here. So we'll be back at 12 then. Yeah. Yep. All right. Okay. We'll see you all soon. Thank you so much. Let's take a break and then be back at 12. Okay. Thank you.
Okay, welcome back. Out there, Doug. There he is. He's joining in. And Adam will be there shortly. You know, he's just. Hey. So I have it. This course goes till two o'clock or one o'clock your time. Is that what you have as well? Yeah. Okay. All right. So in the interest of time, then I'm going to dive right back in here. I mean, uh, I think it was saying one. Yeah. Right? But uh, you depends on how because we are asking a lot of questions. So if you want to run over time, people can leave because we have the recording. We provide the recording to sure. uh, all registrants uh, like within a month. Sure, that makes sense. Yeah. OK, thank you. That's great. That was what I I emailed the emailed the dudes and said, "Hey, we should see if they can go over a little longer, so everybody has time." So I'm glad you said that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um. So I'm going to dive now into Adam Carl before the break. Talked very nicely about the latent variable and measurement piece of SEM. So what is SEM? It's really the combination of factor analysis and the latent variable piece, and then path analysis and the structural piece of the model. So at this point, I'm gonna talk very briefly because of the interest of time, and we wanna to get to Adam Przinsky's full talk about what you could do with longitudinal data. I'm gonna mention mediation and moderation or the structural model piece. So if you have a typical clinical trial, um, and you're organizing the study and you don't know about structural equation modeling, you haven't taken SEM 101 yet, uh, you might construct your trial in a certain way. You will take a whole bunch of baseline measures on patients um, and then patients will be randomized to a treatment or a control group. And then you'll propose to observe, well, what happens post-treatment? So if the interventions for lowering blood pressure, we want to know, does the intervention work better than some control group in lowering blood pressure? And we might go on to take additional follow-up measures. However, what we will likely be missing is everything in the black box I'm talking. So these are all the factors of how exactly does that intervention work in lowering blood pressure? Um, and these are things that are often not considered at base to collect for such a trial or kind of considered after the fact. So what is mediation is it's that it's a three variable relationship at its core um, in the simple cases. And the mediator is this intermediate variable in that relationship that explains how an independent variable influences an outcome. So it's really data to capture that how question or what's the mechanism of change of how this works. As you can see, um, some ex prior examples about such an indirect effect um, we've considered before, but now we're gonna formally talk about that. Um, in treatment studies, this is really helpful. We'll, we'll learn how this intervention works and how for future studies, what's an efficient or effective way of our resources. If we know that how question, we could target that for future interventions. Similarly, even in non-experimental studies, this is really helpful to know about mediation. Um, we could understand how symptoms affect each other. So in a lot of my MS depression examples, it's observational data, and we still want to know what the indirect effect. So at its core, um, without mediation, we, we might have a regression. So we have an independent variable and an outcome. Um, in this 
simple example I'm using, we want to know how more progressive MS, as opposed to relapsing MS, influences the level of fatigue in a patient. So this could be expressed in a simple linear path model. And the effect estimate is C. If we incorporate mediation, so we say hand function impairment is a mediator. So more progressive MS leads to worse hand function impairment, which increases the level of fatigue in a patient. So there's an indirect effect through hand function, as well as a direct effect of MS type on fatigue. A typical assumption that we must make is that there's no unmeasured confounders between the mediator and the outcome. So an example of this in clinical trials, we randomize that baseline for the treatment, but we don't typically randomize for levels of the mediator. So in this sense, um, we make this assumption and in practice, it may or may not be reasonable. So um, there's more advanced SEMs that beyond the scope of this course in which you could specify a correlation between the errors of the mediator and the outcome. And if, this, if you don't believe this assumption is reasonable. So mediation could be broken down into direct, indirect, and total effects. The direct effect is the route from your independent variable to your outcome. Your indirect effect is the route through the mediator. So in terms of parameters, that could be expressed as the product of your two path estimates. And then the total effect is really all paths from your independent variable to your outcome. And that could be the sum of the direct and indirect effect. So in the interest of time, we're going to have to skip ahead a little so we get to Adam's talk. Um, I want to get to the main hypothesis test, which is um, the all rejecting the null is that there is significant mediation. So there's full mediation where the direct effect becomes zero when you include a mediator in your model. And then there's also partial mediation that there, there still is a direct effect when you add your mediator, but there's a significant indirect effect as well. So many, many examples of how to use mediation in health and medicine. And some interesting examples is to evaluate the utility of a biomarker. So if you have a biomarker and you have full mediation, then your biomarker is very useful for representing whatever your outcome is. Um, there's also longitudinal mediation, which Adam Przinsky will touch upon a little bit. So the basic approaches to test for it, um, some of you who are familiar with mediation may have heard about Barron and Kenny and their introductory paper. Um, their approach tests mediation in a series of steps using regression. Um, this approach has gone out of favor because it's too restrictive to follow all the steps. You might miss mediation if, if it's there. The Sobel test um, tests mediation based on the indirect effect. However, it assumes normality of all the paths in the model. So this is also very restrictive and low power. The modern approaches are to use computation intensive approaches, which don't assume um, the paths in the model are normal. So bootstrapping is the preferred approach. And then secondarily, some people use the Monte Carlo approach if bootstrapping is not available. Um, so an instance would be if you have a multi-level model and you want to test mediation, you usually have to do the Monte Carlo approach. So this is just the bootstrap approach. Um, we'll go on to why use SEM for mediation. So it allows you to include latent variables in, as independent variables, mediators, or outcomes. Other approaches wouldn't allow you to incorporate latent variables. You could assess 
mediation um, using a single analysis. So you could really include in real world studies, there could be lots of independent variables, mediators and outcomes in a model going with a real systems, you know, network type of a of model. And you could do it all in a single analysis. Um, other advantages as I proposed previously is we could look at we could evaluate our model with all model fit to talk about the plausibility of our, our theoretical model. Um, we have techniques for, look, for missing data for handling it. And just the language of a path diagram and SEM is just real natural to use for mediation, uh, which consists of hypothesized causal, causal relationships and temporality between measures. So there's many different ways to incorporate multiple mediators. And again, you could do it in line with however your real clinical model is. So here I have hand function and mobility are two mediators. I have two independent variables, MS type and symptom onset, and two outcomes, depression and fatigue. And just like all the other SEM models, we could we could test mediation through bootstrapping of particular indirect as well as total indirect effects, and we could evaluate model fit. Um, there's causal mediation for, any, for those familiar with causal inference methods that allows you to look at non-continuous mediators and outcomes. So the Basic definitions break down when your mediators or outcomes are categorical or count data or nonlinear data. Um, and there's also potentially a treatment mediator interaction. So again, the basic definitions break down if you have any of these scenarios. So there's these causal mediation definitions for um, indirect and direct effects. And then on and that can be incorporated within the SEM framework. In moderation analysis, there's also a third variable included in the analysis. So a moderator is a variable that affects the strength or the direction of the relationship between your independent and direct and dependent variable. Um, and this could be realized either as an interaction term in a model or through multi-group analysis. And really just helps you generalize your findings across different groups. So across gender, race groups, or age groups. There's also a procedure in SEM if your interaction term happens to consist of latent variables. And we'll skip ahead just to finish up with that. These concepts could be combined together. So you could have a mediation process that accounts for moderation as well. Um, so in example A, age is a moderator and number of comorbidities is a mediator. And we have age as a moderator of every path in the, in the path diagram. In B, if in our study, we might hypothesize that age is a moderator, but not between number of comorbidities and systolic blood pressure. So really, you could construct these type of diagrams and conceptual models and the real formal SEM to be in line with whatever your hypothesis is and your data in your real study. Um, so again, these could be expanded to include all kinds of latent variables, et cetera. So whatever your study consists of, there's a, a structural model for it. Um, so I'll stop here before turning it over to Adam Krasinski. Are there any questions? Yeah, if not, I'll turn it over to Adam. Um, one more thing to point out, I think, is the discount code for our book. I think it's ASA 21, so I'll, I'll type it in. It's not slightly different. This is what works. Thanks, Doug. Um, okay, all right, that was, that was awesome. I'm always pleased to 
to be able to um, join these guys. And let me see if I can get my, oops, wrong button. I turned off my camera. Let's see. Okay, if I did that right, then you guys should be seeing my slide deck, right? Oh. Okay, it looks like I froze there for a second, but I'm back. <laughs> I'm back. I'm yeah. back. Okay, all right. Um, so you guys see the title slide, and you can hear me now. Right. Okay, great. Sorry about that. For some, that's the second time that happened, um, where my computer just decided to like take a break for a few seconds. Um, but I think we're good now. So um, I don't think we gave a preview of this, but this. Uh, is the part of the short course where we do a quiz. Uh, thankfully, perhaps to everyone here, um, the, the quiz is mostly fake quiz questions that are jokes. Um, so the first quiz question, and you can feel free to chat and I'll give you like five or seven seconds to chat in your guess at the answer slash punchline. Um, so the first one here is why are SEM researchers so fashionable? And the answer is we have lots of models. The, this this uh, slide has a, has a bit of a purpose for you all though, which is, it's one of my favorite things to do, which is to go to images.google.com and search for structural equation model or models, and then also insert the name of the topic that I'm interested in. So if I put in fluoride hesitancy, it'll show me a picture of something that Adam Carl did. If I put in multiple sclerosis, I'm guaranteed to get something that Doug Gunsler did. But whatever topic I'm looking for, it's just sort of a nice way to do a very fast review, almost a uh, sort of gut check on like, oh, has anybody else put together a model like this? And you can elaborate further and do longitudinal structural equation model of whatever it is you're interested in, interested in. All right, next up, why were the latent variables so sad? And this one, this joke is so bad. That it makes me sad. Any guesses? It's a quiet group today because they are unobserved, right? They're latent variables. We don't observe them. It makes them sad. The, um, the next one, and I was thinking I needed to replace these slippers with the Ruby slipper since you guys are in Kansas. Uh, why did the, the structural equation model need new shoes? And this one you should get, like somebody always gets this one. Any guesses on this one? Um, no. Well, this one is, uh, uh, it had poor fit. So, um, and here, if you guys remember, this is my chance to refresh your memory. Adam Carl gave some rules of thumb for uh, interpreting fit measures and structural equation models. So CFI, usually you want that above 0.95, you know, sort of definitely above 0 0.90. Same with Tucker Lewis, sort of higher and closer to one. Um, and root mean square error of approximation, we'd love to see that down below 0.5 or at least below 0.1. Um, so some nice rules of thumb there for model fit. The why do SEM researchers prefer bow hunting? Oh, Suzanne, that was good. Boots made for walking. I like that. Uh, convergence. Oh, these are getting good. I like your guys' responses. Why do we prefer bow hunting? Come on, this one. I'll give you longer. I'll give you guys a full like seven seconds. Somebody always gets this one. All right, no, so this one is, oh good, Mike has it. It's because we are adept at the use of arrows. Yes, exactly. Um, or we like to draw them, exactly. We can draw them more ways than one. That was fabulous, thank you, Mike. Um, uh, how come the SEM decision scientists never need a compass? This one is a little harder. Um, and we are always on the right path. Uh, in our in our path models, the 
And then I think this is the last one and definitely my favorite. And this one assumes that you were paying very close attention. Um, both both Dr. Gunsler and Dr. Carl uh, use the term that is the pun for this, uh, this question. Why don't they need security at, at an SEM conference? And the answer here is they minimize the disturbance. Of course, disturbance terms are are a form of form of error that we model in structural equation models. All right. So the um, Adam mentioned this briefly um, that we're all fans of M plus for multiple reasons. I like to just give a very clear illustration of that. I love the short courses that have recorded videos on this page. Like there are some deep dive topics. So for those of you who are like maybe you're a little more advanced, maybe you. you you've tinkered with SEM and you're stuck on a particularly hard problem, like special topics here are really good. And then um, you can also ask questions on their discussion board. This was one that I asked like a very long time ago um, that was answered within a few minutes um, with an answer by Linda Mutan. And it like, she just answered like really fast. It's amazing. The, here's one from Doug Gunsler, several years after mine. Um, again, like Bang Butan, like just answered the question within like five hours. Um, also, I think Adam Carl has noted that he typically uses pseudonyms and creates multiple accounts so that he uh, nobody knows <laughs> and thinks less of him for the questions that he posed. Um, so. Uh, this statement, I think both Adam or Doug made the statement in one or other form. It appears in our book a bunch of times. Uh, so structural equation modeling allows researchers to take advantage of reasonable causal assumptions. Yes, that is an, exactly. It's a fantastic sculpture. Um, so it allows us to take advantage of reasonable causal assumptions. Um, here's one that probably is not a reasonable causal assumption. Um, the and but related to that is a model specification proposition, uh, which is that no amount of model specification testing will identify if the model is a good fit, only which is better between the choices you are offering. And while this statement is relevant to multiple types of models, I feel like it's something you really want to keep in mind when you're constructing a longitudinal model. And the problem actually gets worse for longitudinal models because there are so many potential configurations of models where you have to make a decision about how to specify the model. And that's really sort of thematically what I'm gonna cover here. Um, and so before I get there, um, just a, and again, I think we've said this multiple times, so I'll review it very briefly, but there are a few ways that we can think about how, what we mean when we're specifying models. One is that while we're just looking at the difference between specification errors in the first model or initial model we specified and an unknown true model that's out there. And we can use logic theory and evidence to choose that initial specification. And then we can use statistics, fit measures, um, maybe looking at model coefficients if we think that we have a hunch that it's specified properly to compare that initial model to some competing models and then combining our theory, prior evidence, and the results in one sort of group context to decide which, which model we ended up with is the most appropriate. Um, so in that framework, I, I would add to that for longitudinal models that we need models that start with a, with a good th theory of change, or good models uh, should start with a theory of change. Not that, of course, you could specify a model that without a theory of change, but in, in a lot of my work, um, we we definitely have one set of theories. Here's an example. Um, this is a paper from a number of years ago with my colleague, Megan Holmes, um, where we conducted a cohort sequential growth mixture model of changes in, in academic and cognitive development in maltreated children. And here, the specific model that we had in mind was this bioecological developmental systems theory, which is, you know, generally um, from Bronfenbrenner, but the idea that there are these multiple ecologies, sort of like concentric circles of influence um, that over time and through the course of child development will alter either the rate or the way in which a 
a child or a human develops. Um, and so the and so I think you want to have have a good theoretical basis for models that you're testing. And this is in any sense, but in longitudinal, it also forces you to think about, you know, how do we think about change over time, right? What is our what is our theory of change, our model for change? And so I'm going to give some examples of different ways of, of looking at that in longitudinal SEO. So the first, so let's imagine then that we have um, in that we have we've measured two variables. We've measured salt intake and systolic blood pressure. And in the first example at the top, we've measured salt intake in the morning at 9 a.m. and blood pressure at 10 a.m. In the second, we've measured blood pressure um, actually twice at 7 a.m. and 10 a.m. So we had three time points, two variables. But so the first model is just like, we're, we're doing a what effectively is a regression model with two time points and two variables. Um, and in the second model, our configuration uh, is a little bit different and we're just taking a change score. So our, our simplistic way of representing uh, change over time is by actually doing subtraction for the outcome and relating it to the predictor. Of course, everybody's seen a model like this before, but we could substitute these observed indicators in rectangles and we could use two latent variables um, if, we had, if we had concepts measured by, by latent variables as in Doug and Adam's examples. Uh, we can also extend these models into a longitudinal mediation model. So this figure looks almost identical to the mediation examples that Doug showed. Um, the, and so what we have here is the same three variables in the, the prior figure but instead of taking a change score between systolic blood pressure, we're looking at the effect of 7 a.m. blood pressure on 10 a.m. blood pressure. And we're checking to see whether that, that effect is mediated by a person's salt intake at a time point in between. And here, what we're able to do is take a advantage of a temporality assumption and that we know the timing of the measurements occurred in time and time only runs one direction. So that gives us some added confidence in our causal interpretations because of the temporal order of the variables in the model. Uh, and so this model though, like uh, there are other ways to test mediation outside of an SEM framework. I think the framework Doug presents for causal mediation analysis in SEM is very, very strong. Um, but we can extend that even further. And if you remember um, the, so, but before we extend it, actually the, what we'll do is let's imagine now that we measured blood pressure at 7 a.m., 10 a.m., noon and 7 p.m. And we measured salt intake at 9 a.m., 11 a.m. and 6 p.m. Um, and so that this structure results in a relatively interesting data file with seven time points. So what we can do here is estimate an autoregressive cross legs effect model. And so for this model, we have um, six endogenous variables and one exogenous variable, the X1 variable. The X variables here are the blood pressure variables. The Z variables are the salt intake variables. Um, there are some things that, are, that aren't specified in these models that you may have noticed already. So you can see there's not a pathway drawn from say X1 to X5 or from X1 to Z6. So we're assuming in this model that there's no, that the only way that in earlier time points, blood pressure um, uh, directly influences a later time points blood pressure is so between X1 and X5 is through the intervening time point that there, the relationship between X1 and X5 is zero other than the pathway through X3. Our theory might suggest that that's not true for other variables. So we might have, a, we might have some, some circumstance out in the world where our theory of change suggests that there's something special about the first time point. So here, maybe we could even imagine a scenario for systolic blood pressure where maybe waking blood pressure, like that first blood pressure of the day has some special component to it that outside of your salt consumption and outside of the very next blood pressure would give you information about the, 
the later blood pressures throughout the day that you wouldn't get from the very next one. So we might draw that path from X1 to X5 and X1 to X7. Um, so again, good uh, longitudinal model should start with a theory of change. The, but this model, like honestly, like um, these autoregressive models, I've used them a couple of times, but if we can make a growth assumption, we're typically gonna, gonna err on moving towards a latent growth model in SEM. And so here, um, and I'm gonna talk about latent growth and latent growth mixture models. Now these are models where our theory involves a growth assumption. So we assume that a later time point is, is causally related to the prior time point. And that we can typically, there are some scenarios where we can estimate models like latent class growth analysis where we might not need to. Um, but these models are very flexible. They're adept at modeling nonlinearity, and they can accommodate categorical latent change, not just sort of continuous change. And so here we have the same X variables. We've got, um, so these are the same blood pressure time points, but instead of relating them directly to one another with causal paths, what we've done is we've drawn two latent variables, one labeled as I for the intercept, right about over here, one labeled as S for the slope. And what you'll notice the constraints on the path coefficients in these models um, are, are indicated, and it's sort of hard to see, but the path from the intercept to the indicators are all constrained to the same unique value here, it's one. And the paths on the slope are constrained between zero and three, um, indicating evenly spaced time points over time. Uh, if we've had uneven time points, we could we could alter those. Um, the if we had a, a hint at maybe some nonlinearity, we could add a third latent variable uh, representing a quadratic growth function, which would be simply another circle represented by Q associated with the I and the S latent variables, with arrows reaching each of those X indicators, but simply. Um, exponentiating the, or not exponentiating, but um, but taking each of those indicators to the power of two, uh, not indicators, but the slope coefficients to the power of two. And so then that would give us um, an exponential function in our latent growth model. The, the next thing we could do, um, so this is just a simple comparison where we might assume, and so a model like this is sort of what the the teaser I showed you on the cohort sequential growth mixture model of children's academic functioning. And I'll show another example later, but here we've drawn a, a third latent variable um, labeled as C, which predicts the intercept and the slope um, that is categorical. So here we are, we've imagined that there's another unobserved variable, which is the category that a person is in, which is driving both their intercept and their slope in, in a latent growth configuration. And I think this becomes a little more clear when I give the example. Um, I'm gonna skip this, it's not the best slide. So growth models are often called trajectories. Uh, you'll see this in the literature. Uh, regrettably, Adam, the term, yes. There's a question, if oh, I'm please. asked a question about what you just said. Uh, about what do you time. do if, you, if each X is collected at different time points? Um, so Alzheimer's patients come in at different times. Oh, this is great. In a, like, so in a latent growth model, this is tricky. So there are a couple of approaches. So one is you could try to do some conforming of the time points, right? So, um, right, defining baseline is critical and then figuring out how you line everyone up according to baseline is critical. The, um, so if you had an in, if you had a beginning and you thought you could estimate an end time point for everyone, but you didn't know the intervening time points, then that model I showed here, um, actually you can simply omit these two uh, paths one and two. You can omit those constraints and you can just specify the baseline and follow up time points and allow the model to sort of to randomly estimate the spacing, but it's a little bit tricky. Um, and then what if the patient only has two time points, no three and four, can you trust the ML results? Well, so the second half, 
can you trust ML estimation results is a very good question. I would say usually, but, and Adam's, um, Adam's answer is dead on it. It really is depending on your assumption about the, the missing data on, at the missing time points. If you, if, if you can make a pretty good assumption about the reason that they're missing, being missing at random, as opposed to maybe missing completely at random, or alternatively, if your study has adequately represented, if they're there in the baseline time point, and you have quite a bit of data on those persons, which is associated with their presence or absence at later waves, again, I think you can have more confidence in the in the ML estimation results. I would also say it's often more about like how much confidence you have or how much trust you have in those rather than do you or don't you. I think it's sort of, um, yeah. And I, but I mean, that is a, that is a very hard, hard problem. The, we do see this with clinical data. Um, I'm like super curious about your Alzheimer's data friends. Um, I have a project that is developing that is dealing with almost the exact issue. So I would be super thrilled to like have a follow-up conversation with you. Um, so I'm gonna keep wading through some of the other um, the pieces of this example because I think it might help inform some of, of what you're asking. The, um, so, you know, and I, some folks stumble on trajectory and the point of this slide is to say like, don't get too hung up on the meaning of trajectory because there, um, there are lots of different statistical approaches that will end up using the word trajectory in their paper. But if you've seen one paper that uses, that says it uses trajectory modeling, you may not have seen an SEM paper that uses trajectory modeling. Uh, and so confusion is possible. Uh, so, I mean, you really need to be careful and think about what you're looking at. Um, the, the approach in the example I'm gonna use is continuous latent growth curve analysis, LC, G, LGCA, excuse me. Um, before that, I'm gonna show you just this example finding from an older paper by Linda George and Scott Lynch, uh, which, which looked at the change in depressive symptoms for older adults. Um, and this is actually, they, this is a cohort sequential latent growth curve model that they estimated. But a couple of things to look at in this. So instead of looking at change over time, like wave to wave, they looked at change over age in group three-year increments. They use the health and retirement study here. Um, this is a, one of a multi-panel figure. They had panels for folks from multiple racial and ethnic groups that all generally look pretty similar. But if you look at the y-axis here, this was a version of the CESD that I think had eight or 10 indicators. And so they, the, the trajectory they're reporting here is a change over time with increasing age of a little less than one symptom increase over a period of 20 years, which is plausible. But um, again, I think that there's some theory of change that would say like, well, so like on average, do all older people um, increase in their depression a little bit? Like what is our hypothesized, what is our theory of change? How do we think that the change in psychological well-being works over time? The um, so I'm gonna show you some, an alternate way of looking at that here. Again, we're talking about latent class growth analysis, which is sometimes referred to as a subset of general latent variable modeling. The, so why would we ever think that we should use this framework instead of some, some other framework? So one reason is that maybe we think that the average change or that the single derivations on a single trajectory for everybody in a population is not a plausible hypothesis. Maybe we think that like there's, there might be non-uniform variation over time. Um, researchers, oftentimes we, we have a tendency to use methods that are most familiar to us that end up assuming that underlying distributions are purely continuous, but the world may not always work that way. Uh, there might be some unidentified hidden subgroups. Uh, we might try and using it because we have theoretical reasons to suspect that they're underlying subgroups. So maybe you think like, boy, anecdotally, maybe qualitatively, I have some evidence on the ground that like there's a subgroup of, of older people with like really significant um, 
you know, sort of psychological morbidity. And that curve just does not seem to represent them well. And then here, like um, one of my own mentors, Dale Danifer posits in life course theory that um, as people age and grow, that they become more different. So that any general assumption of, of similarity among older adults might, might, might be suspect. The, um, so this is just a simple illustration of what we might find when we use growth mixture models instead of latent growth curve modeling, uh, where we have one best fitted line to a set of points. Um, but actually it might be the case that there, that there are four lines that, that dramatically uh, reduce the residual variance. So the example I'm giving is from about 5,000 older adults in the initial 1992 cohort of the Health and Retirement Study at the University of Michigan, who completed interviews in consecutive every two year waves through 2004. Um, we met there, this is using a scale of their depressive symptoms using the CESD. And we fitted these models using M plus. So what do we ask when we look at results in longitudinal structural equation models? Usually the first question especially for a growth mixture model, is how many classes or trajectories are there? The second question is, what do those classes look like? Um, like, what, what can we say about those classes? And then the third is often what variables are associated with being in a particular trajectory or, or, or latent categorical group. The, so there are, there are a number of rules for determining the number of latent classes. Um, actually, I was literally reviewing a paper this week um, that um, used all of these exact rules. Um, and the, the, the typical most commonly cited as of late is for folks to look at the change in the, in the BIC, in the Bayesian information criteria. Uh, folks will also look at They'll compare just log likelihood values. And then another favorite approach is the low Mendel Rubin test or LMR test. Um, because it is a useful one, I, I, I like to present it and just walk through it briefly here. The, uh, so how this works is really pretty straightforward. So where K is the number of latent classes that we estimated, um, what we get is a p-value for the k minus one versus the k-class model when we run the k-class model. So, and the interpretation is relatively straightforward, which is just the first time that p-value shoots up and is high, then k minus one is the preferred number of classes. The, this is what the table of, of fit values look like for our comparison of between two and eight sets of trajectories of depressive symptoms among older adults. And so you see in the first column, the log likelihood sort of go uniformly down. The BIC goes uniformly down, but it's sort of, there's a slowing effect. Like you could see same with the adjusted BIC. So that like, if you plotted these in a scree plot, you'd see a pretty dramatic scree there. Um, you, you also see the LMR test here when we go from three classes to four. Um, and then from four to five, there's little change from three to four, but going from four classes to five, there's sort of a big jump in the LMRP value. You'll also notice sort of a steady change in the entropy statistic. Here, entropy for most latent categorical models is a simple aggregate indicator. It's an averaging of the latent class probabilities for the most likely class. And so you want that to be high. And see here, so above 0.9 is sort of great, right? Like that means that uh, on average, a person in this data set out of these, you know, 5,195 people, the class we put them in, they ha had on average a 0.925 probability of, of being in that latent class. So it's a pretty strong indicator that we're seeing something useful. Um, but again, it doesn't distinguish super well between two, three, and four category latent groups. So that's one of the reasons we, we prefer other tests, but we also use it as a check on if it's pitifully low, then there might be something else wrong with our, with our model. The, 
And so this is just a visual depiction of what the four glass model actually looked like in this example. And if you think back to the George and Lynch model, which is using virtually the exact same data, um, what we see is that there is this um, sort of hidden subgroup of people, the blue line with the diamonds, it's about one in 20 people or so, right? That have elevated levels of depressive symptoms at every wave as they age. There's another group, there's sort of these two 10%-ish groups, one, the green line, where these folks are experiencing increasing symptoms at pretty much every measurement time point. And uh, another group that's, that's improving over time. And then the last group uh, there, and the largest group is the, the purple group, which so you, could, you can sort of imagine how in Linda George's work, how in their study, the curve that they estimated would be almost like a perfect average of these, right? Um, but what's really going on is you have some very distinct um, changes over time and for uh, distinct subpopulations of psychological well being. And then I mentioned one of the things we want to do often in these kinds of models is, is ask the question well, does anything influence the chance of being in a particular latent group or trajectory? And this is just a simple visualization with on the y axis we have the latent class probability. So the probability of being in that trajectory. And then on the x-axis, the number of years of education that the older adult reported. And here you see this sort of dramatic peeling apart of the trajectories whereby, um, you know, folks with very high levels of education are far more likely to be in the group that has almost no depressive symptoms as they age. And um, there are some differences at low levels of education among those. So at the lowest levels of education, persons with the very lowest level are the most likely to have many depressive symptoms, almost, almost a 50% probability of being in the group that has, has many depressive symptoms. So you can see how this model, you know, which uses maybe a slightly different theory of change, has a wildly different set of interpretations. And I wanna leave some time for some additional questions. Um, you know, we can add, we can, we can look at the effects of multiple variables on the trajectory. We can also use the trajectory in an S SEM estimated model as a predictor of other outcomes. Uh, so it gets to Doug's point and Adam's point that these are really, really flexible tools and flexible multivariate tools and that we can, we can simultaneously estimate influences on multiple dependent variables. Um, so I sort of am ending it back where I started that good longitudinal models start with a theory of change. I've inserted a couple just sort of slides here for if you guys are interested in more of this beyond what's in our book and what I think is chapter 13. A um, couple of really fantastic, if there are some folks looking at clinical trial data, and, and growth mixture models. This is sort of a, a classic paper that is just fantastic. Um, and this is another one that I like for the, the same reason about trajectories. Um, so just a couple of wrap up comments. So, you know, diverse groupings, particularly in developmental science, sometimes are ignored or assumed away when there's like real change that's happening that you should model. So you really wanna think carefully through the consequences of your modeling decisions, like how you arrange those variables in your longitudinal models. And even our most sophisticated techniques can sort of mask or conceal important variation that we would otherwise be very interested in. Um, some common questions that we got, the, and, and I think we got the first one, how big of a sample size do I need? If we add four longitudinal structural equation models, Doug's claim about 200 is probably about right. But if you look at simulation studies, it really depends on the complexity of the model, like, and the number of sort of observed inputs. It can depend on things about the, like the ratio of missing data to observed, the number of time points. Um, you know, typically, I would always prefer to have more. Uh, 200 sort of seems like the absolute bare minimum. Most often, we're looking at much, much larger groups of you know, sort of 2000 and above. The, how many waves of data do I need? Here, you know, sort of for latent growth mixture models, 
and for latent growth curve models, four is sort of a, a bare minimum. For the autoregressive models, um, you can estimate it with what you have, even if it's fewer time points, but what you're gonna be able to make inferences about is gonna be severely constrained according to uh, the, like the fewer the time points that you have. Um, and then my last question here, is the model too complicated? And the answer is probably yes. The, and a, a piece of wisdom that I think Doug already mentioned once is that, and even Adam mentioned this with regard to um, measurement models as opposed to structural models. It's almost always useful to start by building simpler subsets of models and gradually growing their complexity as opposed to starting with like, just put this big like spaghetti diagram and program it all and run it. Because like the chance of you making an error there or doing something that is just not quite perfect is, is, is much higher when you're specifying so much all at once. Um, and it also makes things like uh, modification indices and just general output much harder to interpret. Uh, so we have a little bit of time left for questions. Um, now that I'm on my review slide. So it's flexible. We can estimate and correct for measurement error. We like large sample sizes. It can be challenging to learn. I would say hang in there if you're trying it and getting frustrated and ask questions and find an expert to follow up with. And if you're curious and you wanna try it, I would say, yes, you should totally try it. Uh, the, so thank you. I'm also on Twitter. I will follow you back if you follow me. And mostly I tweet about stuff like SEM and, and health and that's it. Um, so that's all I've got. So questions from folks, I, I wanna, I'm gonna maybe stop the share and see what, what else, or if, if maybe Adam or Doug have any further comments. So a question about instrument development from, from Fran. Is, is it better to modify existing tools how do you use existing tools as anchors? If you add new items, do you specify existing item parameters? I mean, I know I would almost always re-estimate. So in terms of parameters, if I'm adding items, I would be re-estimating intercepts and slopes um, jointly with the new items rather than constraining to older ones. Um, the, but there's probably some Bayesians here who might think about a different way of doing it. Like, I think if you were gonna take a Bayesian approach, like Bayesian SEM, there, there's probably another way to do this. Uh, Adam, I don't know. Yeah, do you, you have... could specify priors now what you know if you did if you did a Bayesian SEM approach, but yeah, I'll leave yeah, so it. I think, yeah, what I think Fran might be asking about here is, so by item parameters, uh, I think she's talking about just a measurement model. Um, and and yeah, I, I always leave the, um, well, I don't always leave the means free, but um, I leave there. So there are different ways to statistically identify a model. I, I don't know, it might've been a typo. I don't know that it's always better to modify existing tools. Um, I agree that it is always worth a, a systematic review of existing measures. Um, we just put in a grant for an R01 to develop a pediatric shared decision-making um, patient reported outcome measure. And I can tell you that there's very little in pediatrics and essentially all of the measures are atrocious that exist. Um, and I apologize if one of the developers is on this call. Um, but there, there are a lot of reasons that there are, there are problems. Um, they have not been well developed, all that stuff. So in that case, I really think it is de novo is the place to go. Uh, in part, because I think we need to do all the qualitative, like the front end hard work of understanding how people conceptualize this has just never been done. Um, so, but having said that, sometimes um, there are lots of situations where a measure is developed, like Promise that did this, and this is what I meant by like a systematic scan. You know, you go in and you do a literature review and Promise, the Promise methodology is trying to amass as many items as you can that already exist. Um, you, you will run into issues of, are they publicly available or not? That can limit things. Uh, and then you can also run into whether other users, existing scales will let you use their 
exact item content for yours. So setting many of those issues aside, suppose I think what Fran's getting at is like in a promise item bank has item parameters and uh, you may divide additional questions, make, sorry, make additional questions that you want to add, like say to that item bank. And then the question as I interpret it is, suppose you had a bunch of item parameters for a set of items and you wanted to add in some additional items. Would you then fix the item parameters that you had existing and freely estimate the new parameters or would you estimate everything afresh? So I hope that's the question. I see you've got your hand up um, and I'll say this and then you can tell me if that's true or not. Um, so just one sec, because this is, will still be relevant. I, so I think this gets back to the point that all three of us have made. It, it's so, and, and definitely my advisor, um, Roger Millsap, who died a few years ago, always emphasized how will the measure be used? And so what comes into play here is um, we just published a paper uh, that gave nationally representative the distribution of promise IRT scores. Uh, we had initially collected nationally representative data because we wanted to re-estimate the item parameters so that we could have a score, a score of 50 represent the mean. And I came into that project a little later than it, when it started. And I argued really hard and strong, and, and I guess you could say one, but wasn't really what I was trying to do, that so many people are using the existing item parameters that they become a little bit locked in, right? And so now the question isn't, could you get better parameters, but are you muddying the pool by, by setting out a whole new set of parameters for everything? So in that case, what I would do is I would fix the parameters to the existing parameters for the items that were the same and then free the parameters for the new items so that the new item parameters were on the same metric as the original item parameters. But having said that, that is conditional on getting a data, a sample that is drawn from the same theoretical population as the original sample. And what I find is that that happens rarely, that you really have a good sample like that for the development. Um, Promise did that for, they have really strong things for all of the uh, adult measures, uh, there was less money available for the pediatric measures. So the pediatric samples were really good, uh, but they were they were not any sort of a random sample. And I, I didn't want to say they were um, a convenience sample because that made it seem like it was easy. But in the sense of a, I spent two years at this at the Census Bureau. So when I say a convenience sample, I just really mean a non-random sample. Um, so that. Um, that is an issue too that comes up. Um, so that's a long way of saying, you know, it, it kind of depends. Um, and I think that both Adam and Doug are right. There are probably some other approaches that you could take around um, fixing those parameters, taking a Bayesian approach. And then, sorry, one other thing I think I might potentially do is not fix all of them. And so, use them as anchors, which is, so in IRT, we call something an anchor when, and in measurement bias too, when we fix it to a quality stay across the group. So we're using its metric to be the point, the, like a stake in the ground and let everything be free around it. Um, one thing you could do to evaluate how different this group is uh, would be to fix some of some, but not all the parameters and see how different the parameters for the, the same items are relative to the, to the old ones and see if they're really far off, because I would suggest to you that you're introducing bias by constraining them. I would make sure you had the means and variances free when you did that, because you don't expect the new sample to have the same means and variances. Sorry, that was a very long answer to that question. It's actually something we think about a lot. So. It was like, a, no, it was good. That was like a very thorough answer. Yeah, yeah. I mean, actually, I, yeah. yeah so is, I, should, I should mention too, even with traditional approaches, there's, um, confirmatory analysis where you actually constrain certain parameters to be certain values. So you could always do that. If you're yeah. positive, like not even using Bayesian with priors, but you could just say this factor loading 0.34, we were positive of that. And, but let's freely estimate the, the loadings for these two new items. Yeah, and Doug, that's something that 
that's one of the things I've been trying to get the promise people to do is, is to, to treat the parameters like they're fixed. And so put the, instead of estimating an IRT score, then using the IRT score in an aggression analysis, mm -hmm. this is probably, this is very problematic in peds. It's hard to get a lot of kids, you know? Yeah. So it's, it's, if we have a hundred kids, that can be a lot of kids. You know, I, I worked with the National Center for Health Statistics. They randomly sampled 42,000 kids of whom 300 had Down syndrome. So, you know, like that, just think about how hard that was to get that many kids. Mm -hmm. um, so, but well, that's what I encourage is when you have a small sample, but you might have known item parameters from another article to fix the item parameters to the measurement parameters to those values. And then you can take advantage of some of the, you know, what's happening with the measurement model, like partially out measurement error and all that stuff and still estimate the latent variables uh, when you have that sample size issue from before. So yeah, I agree a hundred percent. Um, friend said uh, she accidentally raised her hand up. Oh, okay. She she uh, asked all her questions through the chat box. Okay, no problem. Any other questions from the audience? Uh, I do have a question from my pro a project I recently did. So the collaborator wanted to do mediation analysis. So she listed uh, four or five uh, potential uh, uh, mediator. Yeah. And uh, when we do the analysis, we did the individual first and it happened to one of them actually mediating 100, almost 100% 100 of the effect of the covariate. Mm -hmm. So what's the interpretation of that? So uh, I'm sorry, so you're saying you tested this group of mediators and the like mediator? Yeah, mediator, like a, uh, individually. Individually. Yeah, and yeah. then one of them, like uh, the, the, the mediation effect, it's like 100% of the, uh, uh, the covariate effect. Sorry. Sure, so um, that first that, that's um, what we would call full mediation. So once you have that mediation mediator in the model, there's no longer any direct effect. It, the direct effect becomes zero. So that's really powerful if um, you if you have a model without the mediator, take it out, and there actually there's a significant effect. And then once you put that in, you know that fully explains the path. There's no longer any direct effect. It's totally broken. So that's full mediation of very powerful. So that so, means if we have that mediate, all the other four or five, they don't need to be in, the, in there. No, not necessarily true because you haven't tested the model with all of them in there. So that's a different. So right now you're making an assumption about um, adding up all the mediators, it's, which will be gr much greater than one because you're testing them all in separate models. So you really need to test them all in the same model and then adjust yeah. it for each other. So it's you sort could, of- equivalent. You could incrementally sort of add one at a time to that yeah. model. Yeah, that's probably yeah. how I would do it, yeah. Okay. I would put them um, all and then Doug, once. Doug, for in order to in order to give me time for longitudinal, Doug sped through the mediation. Yeah. Um, the I would say his SEM mediation paper, which um, I I often will link in here in the chat, is one of my favorite SEM papers on any topic. Um, I'll find it and link it in there for you guys because sure, it is. Like in addition to our book, this like this is a beautifully written sort of tutorial type paper that's very, very useful. Thanks. What I would say though to amend that is that since he wrote that paper, the science of mediation has evolved a little bit yeah. and he didn't spend enough time on it today for you guys. But the bootstrap approach to assessing whether something is a mediator is really sort of like totally changed how we're able to do this versus yeah. maybe how we would have done it 10 years ago. Yep. Yeah, and exactly. And you could put them everything together and then analyze it. And then you know the effect of each individual mediator as well as the whole 
Um, a good resource, there's a paper by Preacher. Let me see if I can find it where he really, as well as just going through M plus stat model. But let's see if I could, this comes up. He, he's got a really good free article. Thank you so much. This is an awesome short, short course. Here we go. Yeah, this is perfect because it's about, this paper is great because it's exactly your scenario with multiple mediators. Did someone, here's that one. Oh yeah. So the, we are really lucky to be able to talk with you guys. Nothing, honestly, like Adam said at the beginning, yeah. There are very few things the three of us like to do more than sit around and talk about yeah. SEM. It's true. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, <laughs> the, um, we've spent many hours uh, over Zoom <laughs> doing that, um, you know, and prepping the book and uh, arguing about what would go into various chapters. So, um, this yeah, is, I think this is the most popular sh travel short course of this year because I saw the ASA uh page post a different chapter offer a short course i think this one has the most uh, chapters underneath it oh so great yeah so <laughs> how many how many <laughs> uh, uh short course you have given this year so i have lost count yeah, I think this is number five and i think <laughs> Doug, oh. that it's number five that feels right but we also we did one at the Society for Medical Decision Making just a few weeks ago too. So so technically it's like the sixth if we count that one. Right. And oh, we, still okay. have like two, we still have two or three more, right? Yeah. Yes, and there, there are more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Hey, I enjoy it every time. I every get. time it's good. There were, yeah. honestly, there were a couple of new questions today yep. that we have not heard before, which is like after five, I thought we would have heard most of them, but there was, you guys had, Fantastic question. Yeah, I agree. Thank you I so agree. much. I, I will have more questions, like probably sending emails your way. Yeah, and feel so. feel free to email like any of us any point, you know, or so Fran or has one last please. question yeah. about convergence. And I will give some high-level advice on this and then she can follow up via email. So that depends on the problem with convergence, right? So I'm gonna hit the one that I one of the ways that I find this. It, it, in M plus, I don't know how you do this in other programs, you use a little asterisk to give it starting values. So I address one of the places I find convergence issues happening is because it's, you know, it's starting from a very basic place. Uh, and we can talk, you know, it's in our book and lots of other books, what, what the starting values typically are. Uh, what I will do is estimate a much smaller model, you know, a, a very basic model with say a, a handful of variables, and I will, I will then start the next, the, I will increase, as, as each model gets increasingly more complex, instead of letting the, it pick the starting values, I grab the starting values from the previous run for all the paths that I know that exists and start them from there. And that's one of the, one of the ways that you can, um, you can help with that. For program, M plus is not slow for the most part. It's one of the ways you can really help with programs that are super slow. Um, is to give them starting, you know, build your models from starting values. Yeah, yeah Adam is like dead on there. Like that is like yeah. a veteran SEM insider pointer. Yes, <laughs> like if you're if you're building a new model with tons of variables and you're using exclusively the random automatic start values for that big model, the chance of you like overcoming the convergence issues, like it's it could be hard. So starting with that smaller value. And learning the start value values from that smaller model, but then just carrying them forward. Like sometimes that is a tried and true approach. There's still like stuff still breaks sometimes. <laughs> but but that what yeah, what he meant, yes, that is like a veteran move there. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Dr. Uh, Pazeski, Dr. Gunter, and got call again. And uh, thank uh Dr. Izuru uh, Retreatik uh, for uh, facilitate the short course uh, okay. before this today. Oh, yeah, you can speak up, <laughs> Izuru. Yeah, yeah um, oh, sorry. I agree. Yeah, I just, just wanted to say again, thanks everyone. Um, 
greatly enjoyed doing this course. So, and mm -hmm. feel free to hop, follow up with any of us with questions as they come. Thank you, thank you. I, I also want to thank Dr. John Cakley to be like a work in the back to give advices and support this uh, uh, meeting and uh, 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 give us backup on, on being the whole co-host on this in case any uh, other one of us couldn't do it. And uh, uh, last but not least, I want to thank, uh, uh, thank Dinesh uh, uh, Mut <laughs> Mutarantaka for give us the technical support. Yeah, so uh, yeah, he set up two or three sessions that uh, uh, before this short course to go over the Zoom issue to make sure that uh, we are pre be prepared. So. Yeah. Great. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank okay, you. Everyone have thank a wonderful weekend. Thank you, everybody, weekend. for joining Thanks, the show. Thanks, everyone. Have a good weekend. Yeah, and all the questions. Thank you. Hey, John. Thanks, <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Bye. Have a nice weekend. You too.